Court of Fairfax County. It's now attending the Honorable Penny F. Wright presiding. Please be seated for the motion. All right, good morning. All right, if I could have counsel approach for a moment, please.
my microphone on. Sorry, Judy. Are we ready for the jury? Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. All right, Dr. Hughes, if you can come back to the stand for me, please. All right, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. All right, cross examination. Thank you. I'm... Good morning, Dr. Hughes. I'm Wayne Dennis. We haven't met before. No, good morning. Testified yesterday that you have to give uh, careful attention to gendered stereotypes. Correct? That is that is correct. Uh, when you're talking about in intimate partner violence, you have to pay attention to gendered stereotypes. And during your testimony, you in fact paid attention to gendered stereotypes. Correct? I'm not sure what you mean. Well. You said we were going to have to pay attention to gendered stereotypes, and then you testified at length where you referenced both men and women. You paid attention to those stereotypes during the course of your testimony, correct? What I was saying was you have to pay attention to gendered stereotypes when you're conducting these evaluations. You can't assume all the time that the male is the perpetrator and the female is the victim. You have to go into the evaluation understanding that the male also could be the victim of intimate partner violence. In fact, you're aware that there are large-scale studies that do say that IPV towards males does exist. Of course. Okay. And every time you referred to the characteristic of a victim of intimate partner violence yesterday, you used the pronouns she or her, didn't you? I was using the she and her pronouns in this case because my determination was, as I stated, that Ms. Hurd was the victim of intimate partner violence. That is why I was using the she, her pronouns. You, in fact, said women get into the relationship for all the right reasons. That's what you, you said. Woman gets into the relationship for all the right reasons. And then you say difficult for her, for victim to extric extricate herself go on to say that she can and she should. Over and over, you use she, right? I believe in this case I did because I was referencing this case where I found Ms. Hurd to be the victim of intimate partner violence. It doesn't mean that men don't get into the relationships for all the right reasons, too. I believe they do. Nearly every time you referenced the perpetrator of IPV, you used he or him, didn't you? And it goes back to the same reasoning as I'm describing my understanding and my evaluation in this matter. 
Of course, men can be perpetrators and victims of intimate partner violence. That's well established in the research, and that's well established in my clinical practice as well. Isn't the reason that you used the pronouns that you did, that you almost always testify on behalf of a woman? That's not correct. You don't even remember the last time you testified on behalf of a man. Well, I don't testify on behalf of someone. I testify as to the results of my evaluation. I frequently treat and assess male victims of childhood sexual abuse who are coming into treatment for abuse by their Boy Scout leader, by their coach, by their teacher, by a trusted adult. I see them in therapy. I see them in forensic matters in criminal cases. So, so I, I treat and evaluate men I, all the time. I didn't ask you about treatment. I asked you about testimony. You, talk, you broke out your practice between treatment and testimony. I'm not asking about treatment. When's the last time you testified on behalf of a man? I testified recently in a deposition on behalf of a man who was traumatized because he was wrongly convicted. At the time of your deposition six weeks ago, you couldn't remember a single time you had testified on behalf of a man. I testified in my deposition that uh, I testified in a case of a man who was wrongly convicted about 20 years and suffered physical and sexual violence in prison, and I detailed the traumatic effects of the, that that happened on that gentleman. All right. Let's, why don't we take a look at your Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right. Transcript of the deposition that you gave March 28th, 2022, correct? Yes. All right. Let's go to page 77. Let's look at let's page seventy eight line eight. So you can't recall a single instance where you were hired by the attorney representing the male in an IPV matter, correct? In an IPV matter, not in a trauma matter or a child sexual abuse matter. Okay, so that's the distinction. You've never, you don't have any recollection of ever testifying on behalf of a male in an IPV matter. As I stated yesterday, the very first case that I testified in was in a same-sex intimate partner violence where the man was the victim of another man. I uh, okay. routinely treat and assess same-sex couples where the, then the female can be the perpetrator of another female and the male can be the perpetrator or a victim of, of his partner. So... Let me get this. You, you testified in a case where one male is alleged to have engaged in uh, IPV against another male. Correct. All right. Okay. But that's the only one you remember. That's the only one you remember. You remember. No, I've done this frequently. As you well know, most cases don't go to trial. I've worked on hundreds and hundreds of cases. You've limited to testimony. Many cases don't come to trial. But I've issued reports and worked on many cases of same-sex intimate partner violence where men are the victims. But, but I did ask you about testimony, and, 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 and I limited your, the question to testimony, and the only testimony that you remember is the, the same-sex couple, right? There were multiple same-sex couples, I believe, that I testified. That you testified in court at trial. I believe so, yes. All right, but you didn't remember that in, in March. I did remember that in March. Okay. You're a professional witness, correct? That's not correct. No? You make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year testifying in court, correct? Not testifying in court. I conduct thorough, comprehensive psychological evaluations of individuals who are involved in a court case. The majority of those cases never show up in a courtroom. 
and half of my practice and half of my income is about my clinical work with people who are coming to me for therapy. I, I didn't ask you about the other half of your income. I'm, I'm asking you whether you made a hundreds of thousands of dollars a year testifying as an expert witness in court. As you're phrasing that question, that's not correct. I, that would be the amount of income that I generate from my forensic practice. I testify perhaps maybe once or twice a year. The best, of, most of the work is done behind the scenes in evaluating individuals and issuing reports. But you'll agree with me that a big part of that practice is providing expert witness testimony. That's not correct. No? That's not a big part of your practice. If I testify twice a year, that's not a big part of my practice. All the other time is doing the work for the cases and evaluating the individuals and issuing reports. Yeah. What percentage of work do you devote to forensic psychology? As I stated yesterday, I, I say half and half clinical, half forensic, but I also have a substantial amount of time that I use in the professional activities and serving on uh, professional boards. So what portion of your practice do you provide expert witness services? I think you're using the expert witness services synonymous with the forensic psychology part of the practice. So the forensic psychology practice, what I do here today is one part of it, and it's a smaller part as opposed to all of the evaluations and individuals that I'm assessing. Your practice is successful enough that you maintain your offices on Madison Avenue in New York, correctly? Correct. I've had that office since 2005. Right. Um, and you're sufficiently successful at your uh, forensic work that you're able to perform unpaid work at a hospital, correct? Correct, and I also do pro bono work as well. Yeah. Um, in fact, you actually instruct others on the use of expert testimony in court cases, correct? On the use and understanding trauma and violence abuse in the courtroom and how to, for advocates and people who could not have this level of training or experience, how to come into the courtroom and talk about very difficult issues of domestic violence, yes. All right, can we pull up PX 1241? Do you recognize that document? Uh, yes, it looks like the front page of a PowerPoint presentation. And it's a PowerPoint presentation given by whom? By myself and Mary Ann Dutton, who is a uh, very well-known and respected researcher and clinician in the area of domestic violence. And, and what's the topic of the PowerPoint that you're giving? Expert witness testimony in cases involving domestic violence. Okay. And who did you give this uh, presentation to? That was to the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women. Um, that is an organization that provides legal services to women who have assaulted or killed their partners in self-defense, and mostly people who these individuals, the, the women who they've seen in treatment are through shelter-based programs or through advocates, and those are individuals who don't really know how to come into the courtroom and talk, and that's what, what this t um, presentation and training was for. I'm going to move uh, PX 1241 in evidence. Any objection? No, no. All right, 1241 in evidence. You can, do you want it published? Or? Yes, let's publish it to the jury. Thank you. Okay. All right. Why don't we pull up PX 1242? You recognize this document? Yes, this also looks like a PowerPoint presentation that I gave. All right, and what is the name of this PowerPoint presentation? This is called The Use of Psychological Experts in Cases of Domestic Violence. It was presented to the Kings County Bar Association, which is in Brooklyn, and what this presentation talked about was some of the things that I talked to you all about yesterday, the myths and misconceptions in intimate partner violence, when women use force, 
what happens if they drop protective orders, how they present in court, and that's what this presentation was to attorneys at the Bar Association. Okay, but this is another presentation that you gave uh, as to the use of psychological experts, and you gave it to a, to a Bar Association. Right, they were prosecutors and defense attorneys in attendance at that Bar right. Association. At your deposition, you testified that you were going to be paid $100 an hour for your time in this case. I did not testify to that. You did not? That's an error in the transcript. Oh, that's not, a, that's not right. That's correct. So, and you corrected the transcript? We did not do an errata in the transcript at uh, this point. So you knew there was an error in the transcript, but you didn't fix it? There were several errors in the transcript. But you didn't fix any of them? There was no time to fix them. That's correct. All right. So you're not being paid $100 an hour. How much are you getting paid? I'm being paid $500 an hour. $500 an hour. And that's what, um, and that's the bill you sent for your deposition, right? $500 an hour. Correct. Right. Uh, you submitted a number of uh, disclosures in this case. Um, you have not formed an opinion as to whether Mr. Depp committed intimate, intimate partner violence against Ms. Hurd, correct? Correct, I formed the opinion that Ms. Hurd's report of the intimate partner violence is consistent with what we know in the literature about intimate partner violence. You have a limited role here, comparing individual data to group data, and then just determining whether it's consistent, right? I wouldn't say it's a limited role, but that's generally correct. Uh, you wouldn't use the word limited role? A limited role in terms of how we go about a, a forensic evaluation, do not you know a limited you, role in this case. Do you remember whether you use limited role in your deposition? I don't. If you have it in front of me, you probably think I did, but yeah. sure. Uh, and you have no independent knowledge of the facts underlying the alleged abuse, correct? I have the knowledge of the plethora of documents that I've reviewed in this case. No, I'm asking you your independent first-hand knowledge. You have none of that, right? You mean whether I was there? Yeah, you of, weren't there. Of course not. Okay. Um, and you're not testifying to the veracity, the truthfulness of any of the allegations. Correct. I'm testifying to the consistency of the data points of all the different documents, including the psychological testing and the clinical evaluation that I conducted of Ms. Hurd and how that comports with the therapy records and all the other documents and the photos and texts that I reviewed. And you have no personal knowledge of any abuse? Correct, personally. Correct. Right. And all you know is what Ms. Hurd self-reported to you and others? That's not correct. Because you did collateral interviews? And I reviewed medical records, and I reviewed other witness statements of what they witnessed and what they saw. And all of those statements that you reviewed, those were statements that started with Ms. Hurd, correct? Not necessarily. Well, the medical records did, didn't they? Well, the medical records, if she's self-reporting what happened to her, sure. I mean, that's what we do when we go to a physician. We say, I have a headache. We're self-reporting our difficulties. Yeah. Um, everything Ms. Hurd reported directly to you was after she was sued by Mr. Depp in this case, correct? Correct. And you didn't meet Ms. Hurd until, what, September 2019? That was the first evaluation appointment, correct. How'd you get engaged? Engaged? How'd you get hired to oh. do this work? Um, I was contacted by the legal team. Or were you interviewed by her legal team as to whether you were going to testify here? I was not. You were not interviewed? I was not. You were contacted? Correct. Had you worked with that legal team before? I had. Yeah. So they already knew who you were, right? Correct. Right. And at any time that you were working with Ms. Hurd or assessing Ms. Hurd, she could have chose to fire you, correct? 
I suppose her legal team could have chose to fire her. I was not her. She is not my client. The legal team is the one who hires me. I am responsible to the legal team, not Ms. Hurd. And this legal t and the legal team that hired you already knew who you were because you worked together previously. And clearly they knew of my expertise in this area of intimate partner violence and traumatic stress, which is why they contacted me to work on this matter. All right. Several times yesterday you used language about assessing Ms. Hurd's relationship with Mr. Depp. Do you remember talking about that? Sure. You can't assess a relationship without talking to both parties, can you? You certainly can get a lot of information from one party, absolutely. But and especially gonna... when it's buttressed by other documents, including four years of therapy records and couples therapy records, you can get a lot of information based on those documents and that content contemporaneous reports of the relationship. R respectfully, I didn't ask whether you get a lot of information. I asked whether you can assess a relationship without talking to both parties. I believe you can. There are certainly limitations inherent in that, but you certainly can. You talked to Ms. Hurd for, what, approximately 30 hours, right? Correct. How long have you spent with Mr. Depp? I did not spend any time with Mr. Depp. It was my understanding that he did not sit for a psychological evaluation. Right. In fact, you never met Mr. Depp, have you? I have not. But you purport to be able to assess the relationship between Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd? But I also read Mr. Depp's transcripts of his testimony. I watched his deposition testimony. I reviewed his medical records. I reviewed his text messages. So it's not necessarily totally blind. I did have information, although I'm not making a conclusion about Mr. Depp himself. Is the standard now not necessarily totally blind? I'm That's how sure. you assess the relationship? If it's not necessarily totally blind, I can assess it? No, we recess as clinical psychologists relationships all the time. That's what we're trained to do. It's certainly someone who's been trained in intimate partner violence to understand and look for the dynamics that happen in that relationship. And then when we have external data that supports what the individual is telling us, way before this legal case even came on the scene, that becomes very strong data to support that conclusion. Let's talk about some of that data. Sure. All right. Uh, you chose to conduct some collateral interviews. Correct. Right? Um, and you interviewed Dr. Bonnie Jacobs. Correct. And you, you looked at her notes. Correct. And, and you know that Ms. Jacobs, Dr. Jacobs, uh, doesn't know anything about the version of what happened in Australia until Ms. Hurd had already been sued. Correct. I believe she was not in treatment with Dr. Jacobs at the time the Australia incident occurred, so that would be correct. She did reach out to Dr. Connell Cohen about Australia, who she was treating with at that time contemporaneously. I'll ask you about Dr. Cohen. We'll okay. get there. Right. So, uh, you know that Ms. Hurd stopped seeing Dr. Jacobs in August 2014. That's correct. And she didn't go back until after she got sued, right? I believe that's the date. I'd have to look to make sure, but I believe that you're correct. Yeah. And you said you reviewed Dr. Con you, you interviewed Dr. Connell Cohen. That's correct. And you also reviewed his deposition testimony. That's correct. And you know that when that he testified that when he was treating a patient, he assumes the patient is telling the truth. Correct. I believe he said something to that effect in his deposition. And if he has no reason to believe otherwise, if there's no other data to believe otherwise that your patient's not being totally honest with you, then you believe what they're saying. Right. No other data to believe otherwise, but the sole thing that's happening is Ms. Hurd is talking to Mr. Cohen or Dr. Cohen. I wouldn't say she's talking to him. She's going to him for therapy, and he's using his clinical psychological expertise to understand the connection between her symptoms and what she's reporting what's going on in her life. All right. But you understand that he testified that he assumes the patient is telling the truth. Again, 
I understand that statement in his testimony. I have a lot more rich information of having spoken to him for two hours and reviewing his clinical notes. He testified he was making a leap of faith with respect to that, right? With respect to the truthfulness. Again, that was not my understanding of speaking with him and reviewing his notes. I'm aware he testified something to that effect. Right. Um, and you testified yesterday that Dr. Cohen never diagnosed Ms. Hurd with any personality disorders. Do you remember that? Yes. In fact, Dr. Cohen's deposition testimony reflects the fact that he doesn't make diagnoses, correct? Correct. And I asked him specifically, did he have any indications that even if he doesn't, as his practice, use them, does she meet criteria for a personality disorder? And he told me she did not. All right. So you asked him specifically with respect to a topic that you haven't disclosed in your uh, expert report, and then uh, he made a conclusion that's reflected in no document. It's reflected in my notes. It's reflected in his notes about what he's treating. He's treating the symptoms. He's not focusing on the diagnosis, but he is treating the symptoms. You talked about Dr. Cohen's concern for Ms. Hurd's safety. Correct. He wasn't talking about her physical safety, was he? Yes, he was. No, he was talking about her emotional safety. Weren't, wasn't that what he was talking about? He was concerned for both. Okay. Did Dr. Cohen testify that he never had the feeling that Johnny intended to hurt Ms. Hurd? I believe he said that. I mean, he talked about Mr. Depp being very poorly controlled, and that's what made him, him, Dr. Cohen, concerned, because in those moments when he was not controlled, that he could accidentally seriously hurt Ms. Hurd. Let's do this again. Ms. Hurd told Dr. Cohen that Mr. Depp was poorly controlled, correct? That's not correct. Okay. He determined that from... The, in, the treatment he was providing Ms. Hurd. And he also had a couple session with Mr. Depp, and he also had correspondence with Dr. Kipper. So he had other information as to Mr. Depp's functioning. All right, you talked about Dr. Banks? Correct. Dr. Banks was doing relationship consulting, right? Consultation on relationship. Correct. And Dr. Banks only met with them once. Correct. All right. And you did an interview, I think, with uh, Ms. Hurd's mother, Paige. That's correct. All right. You'd agree with me that a person's family member is not the most objective source of information? Sometimes you have to certainly uh, control for that, that the person may be wanting to be protective of, um, of their daughter, of course. And you interviewed Ms. Uh, Paige Hurd after Mr. Depp had already, been sued, uh, had already sued uh, Amber Heard. Right. The entirety of my work in this case happened, obviously, after the lawsuit. Did you review, in that context, any of uh, Paige Heard's text messages with, with Mr. Depp? I'm not sure if I saw them with Mr. Depp. I do believe I saw some with Ms. Heard. I mean, Ms. Ms. Heard, Ms. Paige Heard, Paige Heard, Amber Heard's mother, did talk to me about her relationship with Mr. Depp. And she told you that she loved Johnny even after Amber alleged abuse, correct? She did. All right. Now, you testified that you approach a forensic evaluation with, I think you said it again today, a healthy degree of skepticism. Correct. All right. This skepticism didn't uh, cause you to conduct interviews with, for instance, Laurel Anderson. Right, I did not speak to Dr. Laurel Anderson. And you chose not to speak to Dr. Laurel Anderson because you disagreed with Dr. Laurel Anderson? That's not correct. All right. You know, what did Dr. Laurel Anderson do on behalf of um, Ms. Hurd and Mr. Depp? She was a couples therapist that they sought. They had four couples sessions, um, as I stated yesterday, one of them in which Mr. Depp uh, stormed out of. She did have a long, I guess, evaluation or interview with Mr. Depp individually and with Ms. Hurd individually. And then she saw them um, inter intermittently after 
um, the May 21st, 2016 incident and they, when they were filing for divorce. Uh, so you didn't interview uh, Laura Anderson, but you know what she did? Uh, how'd you figure that out? Because we had her redacted notes and her deposition. All right. And you understood from her deposition that Dr. Anderson didn't believe Ms. Hurd to be a victim of spousal abuse? I believe those were her words, yes. And you also understood from her deposition that Mr. Depp had not had a very long history of being violent with any of his wife or women. That she said that as well. Yeah. But that something about Ms. Hurd significantly triggered him. She talked about that as well. And Dr. Anderson thought that Mr. Depp had been, uh, her words, well controlled, I think for almost 20 or 30 years, correct? Up until this point, I believe she said. Right. Uh, I know that you testified that you reviewed medical records. Yes. So, you know Ms. Hurd had a personal nurse. Correct. Uh, Aaron Filotti. Correct. You didn't interview Ms. Filotti either. I did not. Uh, you know she spent time with Ms. Hurd on a regular basis during her relationship with Mr. Depp. Correct. I had her clinical notes that I reviewed. Right. And you reviewed her, test her deposition testimony. Correct. Some of which the jury's heard, right? I believe so. Uh, and you reviewed, reviewed the, the nursing notes? Yes. So you know that Ms. Hurd admitted to a history of eating disorders to Ms. Filotti, correct? I know that's in the notes. That's nowhere else in any other record, so I'm not sure where that came from. But you relied on everybody else's notes. And there are some things that I disagreed with, like I disagreed with Dr. Laurel Anderson about it being mutual abuse. Right. So the stuff you disagree with, you disregard, and the rest you keep, correct? Well, that's not correct. But that's what you did. That's not correct. All right. Um, you know that Ms. Filotti saw Ms. Hurd immediately after she returned from Australia. I'd have to look at the notes again to be sure, but I know she did see her when she came back from Australia. That's correct. Did Ms. Filotti document any injuries to Ms. Hurd in her notes? I did not see that in the record. Okay, so you looked at her notes, and there's no injury to Ms. Hurd documented in her nurse's notes following her return from Australia? Correct. Okay. You talked about uh, this concept, uh, which you then defined, uh, lethality. And you testify there are certain factors that are present relationship where a woman ends up uh, murdered by her partner. Correct. And that's one of the ways you look at, as to whether a woman is in a very dangerous situation. Correct. Can we pull up PX92? Published to the jury. Yeah, it will be published. <clears throat> Do you know what this is? I believe this is the um, knife that Miss Her gave to Mr. Depp as a gift. All right. And you speak Spanish? Un poquito. <laughs> Do you know what it says? Yes, it says hasta la muerta, until death. So a woman, you suggest has characteristics of being afraid for her life, gives her intimate partner a large knife, which she has inscribed until death. That's your testimony? Well, there's context. Okay. Uh, we can do that later. Uh, so we talked about, you talked a little bit about uh, Mr. Depp purporting to demonstrate uh, jealousy with Ms. Hurd. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Uh, and you specifically talked about Mr. Depp displaying jealousy regarding uh, the ex 
after James Franco. Correct. Yeah. Now, the very first time you met with Ms. Hurd, she talked to you about Ms. Franco, or Mr. Franco, James Franco, correct? I don't know if it was the first time, but I did ask about some other relationships. Okay, so why don't we do this? Let's go uh, PX 1246. I just want to go to the first page. So, do you recognize the document that's in front of you? Yes. All right. And what I would like to do, what is it? Um, it's one, uh, a top sheet of a background information questionnaire that I use to help guide the evaluation. Okay. So, now, this is, who filled it out? I filled it out. Whose form is it? My form. I'm going to move just the first page into evidence because it, we're going to talk about other portions of it later. Could you back out so she can see the first, whole first page? Okay, any objection? Um, yeah, I want the whole thing. Okay, I can't. We will admit the whole thing into evidence. You want the whole thing in evidence? Sure. No objection whatsoever. All right, 1246 in evidence in full. Okay. Are there I, any are there any identifiers that need or we just we're just going yeah, I'm sure there's going to be some. All right. Probably. Okay. So uh, you owe me a redacted one, correct? Don't know what the nature of the redactions are going to be, but. Okay. Well, yeah. you can discuss oh, we'll it. Work, we'll work with okay. you on Thank that. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm All right. Confident there's identifiers in there. All right. Um, 1246 uh, has been moved into evidence. Can we blow up the bottom right hand corner? All right. You want to publish to the jury? Yeah, let's publish it to the jury. I, I don't. Well, we can. It won't want you. Um, I don't see anything on the first if page. If you want to look at that, any objection to that? Well, that's what they're going to show. That's right what now. we're going to show. Okay. All right, publish then. All right. All right. So this is the bottom, bottom corner. Um, your notes, um, and it's under the section of your notes that's entitled intimate relationships. Correct. Right. And one of the notes here on the right, it says JF, that's James, James Franco, right? Correct. Got close but really wanted to, to be with Johnny. Well, it says JF friends. They were friends. All right. It said friends, but you put him under intimate relationships. Well, there's a line there because I was asking specifically about other things that were allegations in this matter. There's a line there because you did not believe that they sh should go under intimate relationships, but it's on your form? She wasn't telling me that this was an intimate relationship. I queried as to what's going on with James Franco because that was something that was raised in this case. Okay. And there's a note for December 2050. When they became more friends, more friendly. Right. And that was a period of time in which... Ms. Hurd was married to Mr. Dunn, correct? Correct. So she became close with Mr. Franco in December of 2015, and uh, at least you put it under intimate relationships. With a line differentiating another part of this document. Okay. Did you provide another header, like the header that says friends? No. No. Well, let's look at the next one. The next one says, I think it says Elon. Correct. That's Elon Musk, right? Correct. All right. May 2016. Correct. Met him at Met Ball. Correct. That's a big fancy party in New York, right? Yes, it is. All right. Um, and she says she dated him after John. Correct. She met Elon Musk in May 2016. When did you file the TRO? Uh, the last answer was May 21st. I believe it was May 26th, 27th, if I'm correct. When did she start dating Elon Musk? Sometime after that. All right. Sometime after the TRO? I believe so, yes. Okay. Yeah. 
You talk, we can take that down. You talked uh, quite a lot yesterday about this concept of uh, reactive violence. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, just so I understand your position on this, is it your position that if Miss Heard was abused, she gets to hit Mr. Depp? That's not my opinion. But you know she hits him, right? And I testified to that. Right. And how many times do you believe that she told you that she hit him? Do I believe that she told me, or how many instances were there? Well, I don't know. How, you, how would you know other than her telling you? You weren't there, right? I was not there. That's correct. All right. How many times did she admit to hitting him? She indicated a number of times in a number of instances. Right. Um, you indicated that you would listen to audio recordings as part of the work you did in this case? That's correct. All right. I'd like to play you a portion of one of those recordings. It's Plaintiff Exhibit 343. It's already in evidence. And for the record, the portion I want to play is 2 minutes 46, uh, 24601 to 247.20. Um, I said, no, I said to you, hey, tell Travis what just happened. Oh, you told me to do it. You yeah. told me to. You said, go do that. I said, no, you tell, tell him what just happened. And I lied. And that you punched me in You're the right. fucking thing. And you, you figured it all out. And you said, no, fuck it. No, I didn't. What the fuck are you talking about? And I, I watched you, you lie. And then I, I didn't I punch said, you, by the way. You, I'm sorry that I didn't uh, uh, hit you across the face in a proper slap, but I was hitting you. It was not punching you. Babe, you're not punched. Don't tell me what it feels like to be punched. You know, you've been a lot of fights, been around a long time. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, when you fucking have a close. You didn't get punched. You got hit. I'm sorry I hit you like this, but I did not punch you. I did not fucking deck you. I fucking was hitting you. I don't know what the boat motion of my actual hand was, but you're fine. I did not hurt you. I did not punch you. I was hitting you. How are you? Talking? How? What am I supposed to do? Do this? I, I'm not sitting here bitching about it, am I? You are. Oh, That's the difference between me and you. You're a fucking baby. Because you start. You are such a baby. Grow the fuck up, you Johnny. Did you start a physical fights? I did start a physical fight. Yeah, you did, so I had because, to get the fuck out of there. Yes, you did. So you did the right thing, the big thing. The, you know what? You are admirable. You agree with Miss Heard that it's admirable to retreat from a fight? Is it, is it admirable? To, it is admirable to retreat from a fight. Yeah. Um, anything about this tape suggest to you that it's characteristic of reactive violence? In this instance, if true, if she said she hit him first, then that would not be reactive violence. All right. You testified that Ms. Heard reported to you that she engaged in low levels of violence, correct? Well, I don't think she said that. I think that was the characterization of knowing the types of minor and severe levels of violence. Oh, okay, I, I, I got it wrong. You consider low levels of violence. Well, I consider what the literature and the research talks about low levels of violence as opposed to severe um, levels of violence. And I, I think you, you suggested if you, that uh, Ms. Hurd sustained more severe uh, injuries, correct? I think I said more frequent injuries. More frequent, but not more severe. Um, well, certainly uh, the incidents in Australia and the sexual violence and the incidents on December 15th, 2015 were quite severe. Right. Um, you said you reviewed medical records in rendering your opinion. Correct. Uh, and you, rev re you reviewed photographs? Correct. Now, the, other than the reports to her therapists, which you call medical records, right? Yeah, I would call those medical records, right. sure. Other than the reports to her therapist, there's not a single medical record that reflects any injury to Ms. Hurd, is there? That's not correct. No. There is not a, other than what doctor reflected injuries to Ms. Hurd? 
the note by Erin Borum, uh, her married name, a lot, I'm not recalling her married name, indicated that she was headbutted by Mr. Depp and that she went for a concussion check and she had a busted lip and then she went to Dr. Kipper's office in order to get checked. What, and there's a medical record other than that note that reflects it? There's a note that she showed up at Dr. Kipper's office. There's a note in the but similar two days Dr. that Dr. Kipper, Laurel Anderson saw the two bruises from that same incident as well. All right. Um, you reviewed photographs. Yes. All right. Um, I'd like to put up PX 144. Uh, it's been published to the jury briefly. I'm going to keep it up very briefly. That photograph doesn't reflect a low level of violence, does it? Well, that reflects a severe injury, I would agree. Yeah. Why don't we go to PX 145? That's a severe injury that ended up with Mr. Depp on a gurney, correct? That is a severe injury, correct. Yeah. Is it your testimony that throwing a can of mineral spirits at your spouse is characteristic of reactive violence? If you are running away from your spouse who is trying to hurt you, yes. All right. So, so you, you can throw a can of mineral spirits. What about if you throw a can of Red Bull? Again, it depends on like, the incident I think that you're referring to. That was not necessarily reactive violence. That was in a state of frustration or anger. Right. So, so when you throw a can of Red Bull in a state of frustration or anger, that's not reactive violence? No. Right. What about if you throw a bottle of vodka because your husband fell off the wagon? Is that reactive violence? Are you asking me hypothetically? I'm asking you, would that, would that be a characteristic of, of reactive violence? Throw a bottle of vodka because your husband fell off the wagon. If it's in the middle of an assault, perhaps? If it's independent of that? No. Right. So, for instance, if your husband was just having a couple of shots at the bar. Again, you would need more information and context to right, make right. that determination. All right. I, you don't think that's a, a reflection reflective, uh, of reactive violence. And you'll agree with me that when you throw the second bottle, that's not reactive violence. If somebody's throwing multiple bottles, again, psychological violence and abuse is psychologically destabilizing, which destabilizes individuals' coping strategies. That is absolutely true. Lost what's true. Um, is it your testimony that once you've thrown one bottle and missed, when you throw the second one, now it's reactive violence? That's not what I'm saying. I don't think throwing bottles is acceptable in any context. All right. I'm going to ask you about some of the testing that you uh, did. Um, one of the things that you uh, did was a uh, was a form was like uh, called a CTS two relationship behaviors form. Uh, the conflict tactic scale, correct. The, the, so CTS-2 stands for Conflict Tactics Scale. That's correct. And this is one of the documents that um, you had with you on the, on the stand yesterday. I had all my testing with me and all my clinical notes from my evaluation with Ms. Hurd. And you gave me a copy of it because you looked at it during the testimony. Because you asked me, so I gave it to you, yes. Right. All right. Um, but you have a good re recollection of what that test is about, the CTS-2 test. I have a very good memory and a very good recollection. I want to give the jury the most accurate and thorough information. I've having done 12 tests 
with so many questions, I wanted to just be as accurate as possible. The, I'm sure the, my memory would miss some things that might be relevant. All right, so let's talk about the CTS-2. It's dated 9-26-2019, uh, 2019. Correct. All right, 9-26-2019. And it goes through and it asks a whole series of questions about what you've done and what your partner has done. That's correct. There was tons of these questions. Correct. And every single one of those questions is preceded by the same question, right? How often did this happen in the past year? Correct. You knew that as, uh, as of 9-26-2019, not a single one of the things that Ms. Heard identified happened to her in the last year. Correct. Right. She was oriented to a different time frame to get a checklist of those behaviors. Right. And one of the one of the the uh, although it says please, how often did this happen in the past year? One of the questions is, my partner used force to make me have oral or anal sex. Correct. She went with zero on that, right? I'd have to see if you'd like to show me. No. Do you have any recollection that she she didn't go with zero on that? I have a recollection at that point in time she was framing those type of acts as angry sex. Right. She and wasn't framing them as physical force as most women don't on these measures. And you helped her to reframe it as something other than angry sex, didn't you, doctor? Right. My job was not to do treatment. My job was to do an evaluation, and that's what I did. All right. Um, so you did an evaluation, and one of the evaluations you did and one of the diagnoses that you ultimately made relates to PTSD. That is correct. All right. And you diagnosed Amber Heard with PTSD long before you made use of the gold standard test for PTSD. That is correct. All right. And I make the diagnosis of PTSD in my clinical practice without using the CAPS all the time. All right. So just so you and I are on the same page, and I think we are, uh, this gold standard test that I'm referring to is the CAPS-5. That is correct. That's the one that Dr. Curry administered, correct? Correct. All right. Uh, You didn't administer the CAP-5 until, A, after you'd already diagnosed Amber Heard with PTSD, right? She had PTSD in 2019. She had PTSD in the beginning of 2021 when I evaluated her. And then she had PTSD in December 27, 2021 when I administered the CAPS. That's correct. Uh, Eric, um, I think I asked a much more narrow question than that. You, you didn't diagnose... Uh, and you, you didn't give the CAPS-5, oh, no, I'm going to strike that question altogether and start it again. You had already diagnosed her with PTSD before you did the gold standard, correct? Before I administered the CAPS-5, there was enough data in the psychological testing and my clinical evaluation to establish that she met criteria for PTSD. That is correct. Uh, um, you submitted a... Expert disclosure in this case on January 11th, 2022. I believe the attorney submitted that disclosure, yes. Uh, you participated in that? In the, in the January 11th? It was the same disclosure that went before. There were no changes on right. that. Did you reference the CAPS-5 in that at all? I don't believe I gave the results of the CAPS-5 to the attorneys at that point. All right. Um, You met with, oh, I, I got dates here. This time I'm using the cheat sheet. All right. Uh, you met with Amber Heard on September 26, 2019. I would love to have my cheat sheet, but I'll take your word for it. I'll share. Thank you. October 11, 2019. When do you give the CAPS 5? The CAPS-5 was administered the last time that I saw Ms. Heard. I saw her over, as 
and stated multiple times over the past two and a half years and having not seen her in about a year to get an accurate assessment of her current symptoms. Having had all the background information, the CAPS-5 is a great structured clinical interview to do that. All right, so you hadn't seen her for about a year before you, b before you gave her that test. That is correct. Um, and you did it over Zoom? That is correct. All right. Um, why don't we pull up uh, PX1247? This may. I'll get you that. Sure. It's just to the witness right now. So. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, um, you, you can, Dr. Hughes, you can actually help with that question. This is like 20, more than 20 pages long. Right? It's about 20 pages. Right. All right. Let's get. Um, this is a series of questions that you use to test for PTSD. Correct. Um, and you recognize the first page. This is the first page that you um, you filled out. That's your your handwriting. That, that's correct. I'd like to publish the first page to the jury. You wish to have it in evidence? You're moving it into evidence? Yes, I am. I, I, I'd like to have a copy of this. He's just publishing the first page. Any objection to the first? Okay. First page in evidence? Or? Uh, could you put your microphone on? I'm just having... I don't have the ability to scroll down, so I can't see the rest of this. Right, it's a brand new exhibit. I'm sure they'll get you a copy of it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'd like to go to the second page. Can we put up the second page? Are you putting the second page into evidence? Not yet. Then I can't put it up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'd like the... I'd like the witness to see the second. The witness can see the second page. Thank you. This is the second page. This is instructions on how you do it. Correct. All right. And then we'll go to the third page. Let's let the witness see the third page. Now this is entitled scoring. Correct. So when you score, you look at two things, right? You look at frequency and intensity. Correct. All right. Those are the two factors you use to score. Correct. All right. Can we go to the fourth page of this document and just show it to the witness? All right. So, Dr. Hughes, this is the first page of the CAPS B where, um, other than the identifying information, where, where there's any input into the document, correct? Uh, the CAPS FOD, you said the CAPS B? Yeah, I, I misspoke. Okay. Yes, this is the, um, the criterion A, which means that in order to, as I said yesterday, to obtain a diagnosis of PTSD, you have to have sustained a very specific traumatic event. That's the first B, to get through the door. All right. So. Your Honor, I'm going to, um, I'd like to be able to get them a copy of this. Is it, is it too early to take the break or? A little bit if you All can. All right, I can do something. Okay. Yeah. All, right. Um, all right, so do you recognize the first page, or the fourth page of this document? Yes, I do. And the, the handwriting on the fourth page is yours? It's all my handwriting. All right, the entirety of it is your, I'm going to move uh, this uh, document into evidence um, uh, along with the first page um, and that one is what number I think it is 
you're still on 1247. 1247. Okay, so is, you want to move the entirety of 1247 in? Yes. Do you have a copy of 1247? It's exhibit 1247. Well, I don't have the whole page in front of me. I well, I mean, do you, do you have plaintiff's exhibits 1247? I think it's 1247. Yeah, I don't have it either. Oh, it, it's defendants 1435. 1435. Defendants 1435. Take your time. Did you want to take a look at the court's copy? Would that be easier for you? It's, a, it's 59 pages. Um, I, it, what is he moving in? I mean, I don't think I think he's moving the in. Are you moving the entire document in? Yeah, I'm going to move the entire document in, Evans. I don't think I have an objection to that. No objection? No objection. Did you want to take a look at the court's copy, or you're good? Uh, I would. Thank you. I have my apologies. That's fine. No objection, Your Honor. All right. So even though I pulled it from um, defendants 1435, we want to make this 1247 plaintiffs, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'll, I'll, did you have one? I, 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 I kind of need it. All right. <laughs> Thank you. We'll just change the number on it. All right. All right. So it's 1247. I said, okay, 1247 in evidence. Plaintiffs 1247 in evidence. And now it can be published to the jury. Thank you. Why don't we publish the fourth page where we're talking about it? All right. Um, so wh what this reference is, is uh, the event you said was the worst. Um, and what you have filled in here is three words. IPV by John, right? Correct. And then what happened is the next box, and you've n not written a, a single thing in the box, right? Because I've already spent 20 some odd hours with Ms. Hurd, I know what goes in that box. You if see, you look at the top, it says administer the life check checklist or an other structured trauma screen. That screen had already been conducted. Right, but there's a box on the gold standard test that asks what happened, and it says, how old were you? How were you involved? Who else was involved? Was anyone seriously injured or killed? Was anyone in life danger? And none of that information you provide in your um, analysis on the CAPS file. Your Honor, I hesitate to object, but that's a very common problem. It is. Okay, I'll sustain the objection if you want to rephrase. We can do it uh, okay. the slow way. The first question is, how old were you? All of the information that would go in that box is contained in my 80-plus clinical notes of my evaluation of Ms. Hurd up until this point. It would have been incredibly redundant to do that again here. But you knew other people would review this, didn't you? And I knew that they would have my clinical notes as well. Oh, so they're supposed to parse through your clinical notes so that they can figure out what you chose to be the anchoring event. I didn't choose to be the anchor. The client chooses to the anchor to identify what the worst event is for them. You wrote IPV by Johnny. That's what you determined to be the anchoring event. When I asked Ms. Hurd, once again, of the traumatic events that she experienced in her life, which one is the worst, this is what she indicated. Okay. But you provided no details with respect to it. There are de a plethora of details in my 80-page is a handwritten, single-spaced clinical notes. Right. All right. Let's go to the next page. All right. You felt it appropriate 
to fill this page out, uh, didn't you, Doctor? Well, these are the questions about the symptoms, so I'm asking specific questions and getting her responses. Didn't you know this already? Well, I was making sure at this point, having not seen her for a year, what is the trauma expression at this time? It can change over time. It could go away. It can get better. It can get worse. All right. Why don't we go a couple more pages in. Uh, let's go into uh, page 7 of 20. Now, there are a couple of uh, boxes that you filled in on this Let's look at item five, B5. You don't provide any indication of what kind of triggers, what kind of reminders trigger these reactions. She answered that on the previous questions. All right. And it, you didn't provide any answer as to how long does it take to recover. She has some difficulty recovering. Okay. And then there's this question that says, how often has this happened in the past month? Number of times. Correct. And we talked about how these things are scored, and we looked at, you got to look at frequency and intensity, right? Correct. And you left the frequency box blank. Well, no, if she said several times a month, then that's what the frequency is. And you didn't fill that frequency box in at all? Because she told me it was frequently several times a month, which is one of the anchors encoding the caps. All right. Let's look at the next one. The very next box. Again, this is scored by frequency and intensity. How often in the past month? Correct. Blank. Pardon? How often in the past month? You left that one blank again, right? She tells me it happens at least twice a week, so certainly I could multiply two times four and put an eight. And you certainly could have written the number two. But it wasn't two. If it's oh. happening two times a week. All right, so two times a week towards the, times the number of, of months. Now you got two digits in, instead of one, right? That's all it took to write that down. This is in, in a one-month period, so it would have been a four-week period. How, after, how often in the past month? That's what it says. Correct. You, you said months. not to answer that question. Uh, let's look at the next page. Again, scoring is frequency and intensity. How often in the past month? Again, you left it blank. If you look on the right-hand box, that is where we are indicating the frequency and the severity. If you can see where I circled moderates happening more than twice a month, that's where I'm indicating the frequency of the symptom expression. Okay. But you're, aren't you skipping a step? You're supposed to do intensity and frequency. And when you're, somebody says it's happening more than twice a month, that is a frequency indicator. All right. Um, let's go to the next box. Again, we have, in the past month, how many of the important parts of event have you difficulty remembering? Number of important aspects. Didn't fill it out. Well, I listed two specific incidents of where she indicates she has important aspects that are missing. But, but all you have to do is put a number in here. You, know you, had to, you knew how to score this thing. Well, this measure actually doesn't get scored by the frequency. All right. You're, you know something, you're right. Let, let's look at the next one. I know. The next one gets scored by the frequency. That's blank, right? Well, I did not code it as a PTSD symptom. Okay, let's go to the next one. How much of the time in the past month have you felt that way as a percentage? Right. So as you can see, I circled 20 to 30 percent of the time. Right. It, it just is it, I'm putting it on the right side in the right. box where I'm coding the instrument. We're, we're, we're going to talk about the right side in a minute. Um, 
You took issue with the way that Dr. Curry did this test, didn't you? Correct. All right. But your test, in every instance where you're asked the number of times and to fill in the blank, you leave it blank. They're on the right side of the document. All right. You want to talk about the right side of the document. Let's do that. After you did the CAPS-5 for the uh, anchoring, the three-word anchoring event, IPV by Johnny, you went back through again and said, you know, uh, maybe I should consider childhood trauma as well, right? I wanted to test for the limits and see at this point in time, um, Ms. Heard had had a child, and sometimes when people have children, their trauma gets evoked. Is she having those symptoms as well? She already had, based on this instrument, the PTSD from the interpersonal violence. I wanted to see if there were any additional symptoms. All right. And you knew that she had had severe child abuse as a young person. That is correct. She grew up in a home full of heroin addicts, right? Opiate abuse, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and there, there was IPV between her parents. Correct. And so you wanted to make sure that there wasn't some impact with this childhood trauma in the diagnosis of PTSD. Yes. Right. And so you decided to give her the test again. Well, I didn't give it again. What's called testing the limits. I went back to some of the um, questions where she answered in the affirmative and said, and is this also happening vis-a-vis -vis your childhood abuse? Are you also having intrusive thoughts and feelings about childhood? Are you avoiding thinking about things about childhood? Is that happening for you now as well? All right, so there are a series of notations on the right-hand side. Let's go to page um, 520 in the test. All right, why don't we highlight the, the, the right-hand notations that start under the word childhood? All right. So the way you tested for childhood PTSD is to write a notation in the corner and answer a couple of questions. Same test. Well, I wasn't administering a whole CAPS again. What I was doing was seeing, as we know with people who have what we call polyvictimization or revictimization, someone could, in fact, meet criteria for the PTSD from the domestic violence but then they're also experiencing some symptoms as a result of the childhood abuse. Both can occur. Right. But Mr. Depp isn't responsible for her childhood abuse. That is correct. Right. And the way you tested this childhood abuse PTSD is you made notations on the right hand in the right-hand column of a, of a form that you partially filled out for the IPV by Johnny. Right? Well, I disagree with the partially filled out. The frequency was clearly filled out in the box where we score the caps. But yes, I did write about the childhood to the right of that box. Okay. And that is the pr appropriate way that the gold standard test for PTSD for childhood trauma should be administered. If there were any affirmatives and I needed to go further, I could have administered another CAPS-5. There were not. I did not need to do that. Okay. So you chose not to do a second CAPS-5, although you knew that she had suffered from severe childhood trauma. No, because she wasn't suffering symptoms at that point in time, PTSD symptoms from the childhood trauma. All right. Mr. Denison, are you moving to a different topic now? I or am. Okay, all right, this might be a great time to take our morning break then. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll take our 15 minute break. Please do not discuss this case with anybody. Don't do any outside research, okay? Thank you. Go ahead and take. Mr. 
Your Honor, before yes. we take the break, yes. may I get a copy of the new exhibits from them so that I can see it over the break? Yeah, you, you, I don't know if we can do it before, but we'll certainly get them to you. Well, I, I mean, I need to be able to sure. uh, read the rest, and I have never seen it. Okay, well, we'll, 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 we'll go through it. That's but fine, all right? It's, all right. It's, it's, although it's in your exhibit list. Oh, that's well, fine. If, it, if it's in my exhibit list, if they just tell me. They tell you the fine. exhibit numbers, that's okay. fine. We'll work okay. through it. Okay, we'll take a, let's take a recess at 1140 then, okay? Thank all you, All right, we'll be back at 1140.
All right, we ready for the jury? Thank you. Seated. Next question. Why don't we put it uh, back up, plaintiff's uh, 1247. Um, again, this is the caps five. Um, you didn't administer this until you already had Dr. Curry's scores, did you? That's not correct. No, you, you administered it after Dr. Curry made a disclosure, correct? That's not correct. You administered it um, after Dr. Curry had administered hers. I learned that in late February when she submitted her report, but I had no way of knowing that in December of 2021. And you didn't make any reference to this uh, in your disclosures until after Dr. Curry made reference to hers, right? I don't recall the date of the final disclosure or the fourth disclosure. All right. Can we go to the next page? Let's go to the top of the page. We'll blow that up. Instructions start with standard administration and scoring of the CAPS-5 are essential for producing reliable and valid scores and diagnostic decisions. See that language? I do. Right. You don't contend it's standard uh, not to fill out the frequency labs. I think if you're filling it on on the right side of the box, I think that's perfectly fine. All right. So you think it's standard administration to, to simply leave blanks that are already in the form? I didn't leave blanks when I needed to find out the frequency of the symptoms. All right, let's go down a little bit further. Uh, let's go to administration. It says, number two, read prompts verbatim, one at a time, and in the order presented, and then has a has a variety of exceptions. With respect to the childhood trauma notations you made in the margin of the CAPS-5, you didn't read the prompts verbatim, did you? I read the first prompt. If there was a yes, then I would have made a decision, do I need to administer a whole nother CAPS? Right. And you ultimately didn't do that. You just simply wrote the margin of the last one because she wasn't endorsing those symptoms. Okay. Um, you, you talked about the endorsement of symptoms. Um, ultimately, what you're looking for with respect to uh, PTSD is uh, functional deficiencies. That's one of the things you look for, right? Well, with any uh, DSM diagnosis, you're looking for what are the functional impairments as a result of the symptoms that the individual is experiencing. Okay. So, and in fact, if you go to the, all the way to the end of the form, uh, one of the things that we deal with is uh, impairment in occupational function, right? Correct. All right.
What's Ms. Hurd's occupation? She's an actor. All right. And she's in, she had just wrapped a major motion picture, correct? That's correct. So you didn't determine that she had an impairment in occupational function. She's still performing at literally the highest level of her profession, correct? She had a number of PTSD symptoms while she was filming Aquaman 2. Right. That interfered with her ability to really organize a lot of resources for herself in order to go forward and film that. I asked you whether production. she was performing at the highest level of her profession, yes or no? I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that. Okay. Um, but did she report to you that, that she loves to cook? She loves to cook, yeah. yeah. Hike. I don't recall hiking, but. Read. Yep. Spend time with friends. If she can, that has been significantly diminished as a result of her PTSD symptoms and as a result of this case. Uh, she just had a baby. She did. Right. Exercises every day. The, the most that I can tell, she does. Yeah. Uh, completed level three sommelier training. She did? All right. She did all of these things, um, and you've made a determination that she is impaired with respect to her occupational functioning. I made a determination that the symptoms interfere with her functioning. She does these things, but it's not like the symptoms aren't there. She has to continue to work even though she has a panic attack, even though she has an intrusive recollection of the trauma, even though she's having heart palpitations and sweaty palms when something comes into her mind. It does not stop her from doing what she needs to do, but it does interfere. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask you about another test that you administered, um, and that's that was called the PAI. Do you know that one? Yes, I do. Uh, the, that's the personality uh, assessment inventory. That's correct. Why don't we mark, uh, why don't we uh, put in front of the witness the PX 1244. All right, 1244. Dr. Hughes, do you uh, recognize uh, PX-1244? Yes. And it's a list of critical item endorsements? Correct. And, and that's derived from the PAI? Correct. Um, and this is the PAI that you gave 9-26-2019? Um, I don't have the cover sheet in front of me, so. Uh, it, it, why don't we scroll down to the bottom, Tom? Yep. There Thank it you. is down there. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Um, now, critical item in one, I'm going to move uh, this document, uh, PX 1244, into evidence. Your Honor, I would uh, request that the entire document be put in the constitutional application. I'm only going to ask her about this piece. Uh, I still go down. Well, he, it's, his, it's his exhibit. Do you have any objection to his exhibit, which is just the first page? No. All right. 1244 in evidence. Okay, so critical item endorsement, this starts a total of 27 PAI, PAI items reflecting serious pathology have been very low endorsement rates, have very low endorsement rates in normal samples. These items have been termed critical items. You're, you're familiar with that concept? Yes, I am. All right. And, I just want to ask you about a couple of the critical items. Uh, the first one is uh, potential for aggression. This was deemed, a, under your PAI, a critical item. And it says, sometimes my temper explodes and I completely lose control. 
How did that uh, potential for aggression bear on your analysis? Well, there's a few things. Number one, certainly uh, Ms. Hurd reported to me that in her relationship that would happen. Her anger and her affect regulation would become impaired. Um, number two, you have to look at the total scales where that scale is not elevated, so it would not be a major cause of clinical concern. Number three, she had four responses that she could say to this question. Mainly true, uh, very true, mainly true, sometimes true or false. She chose sometimes true. So she's answering honestly about her experience. So sometimes, it's sometimes true that sometimes my temper explodes. That's Correct. what you're testing. Correct. All right. So th you've talked a little bit about this concept called malingering. And there's one here for potential malingering. And this is another one of these critical item endorsements. Critical items means that these are uh, serious pathology, right? Okay. Well, as you can see, it says endorsement of these critical items is not in and of itself diagnostic. No, so you I, need to review the content of the item, and that's how you make the determination. Is this something of clinical concern that you need to do more understanding about? Okay, so this critical item endorsement, this one reads under potential malingering, I think I have three or four completely different personalities inside of me. Correct. And she endorsed that as sometimes true. Correct. Okay. And there's not one elevated malingering scale on the PAI. Yeah. Let me ask you about uh, another document. Mark the documents PX twelve forty eight. Twelve forty eight. Twelve forty eight. All right, yes, sir. Can you put up PX 1248 just for the witness? Dr. Hughes, do you recognize this? Yes. All right. And these are critical items that were deduced uh, on the TSI 2 critical items list. Correct. And what's a zero mean? It means that she scored a zero on that item. She said it's not something that's relevant for her at the time frame that the test was administered. Um, and these are all self-reports, right? Correct. Um, and so she scored a zero on doing something, something violent because violent because you were so upset. Correct. See that language? You knew um, Ms. Heard to do violent things when she's upset. This test specifies how often have you had these symptoms in the last six months? Just in the last six months? Correct. All right. So she hadn't had them in the last six months? Correct. This test uh, also asks and inquires about intentionally hurting yourself or cutting. In the last six months. Right. Is the prompt. All right. In the last six months. Correct. Had Ms. Heard previously indicated to, your, to you that she cut herself? She indicated one time as a teenager in a reckless moment she did. It was stupid and I never did it again. So that was the first time you met her. She indicated that she uh, had cut herself. What did you do to satisfy yourself that she didn't continue to engage in that behavior? 
as with most things, I asked about the frequency of the behavior and had it ever occurred again. Had she ever engaged in suicidal behavior or suicidal gestures? That's part of that screen. Where did Ms. Hurd cut herself? I'd have to look at my notes to be sure. All right. Um, why don't we do that? That's in your intake note, correct? Um, let's, let's I don't recall. All right, why don't we go to PX 938? And uh, if you'd put it up for the witness. All right, that's not it. Let's go to the next page. There we go. All right. PX 938, we're on the third, we're on the third page. Um, this background information uh, sheet has uh, already, been, already been admitted into evidence. Um, and there's a discussion here uh, we talked about earlier uh, about intimate relationships. I'm, I'm sorry, the question? Yeah, let's go back to the first page. All right, there we go. Um, what number was this? Right. This is in at 1246. So I, this page, anyway, I'll ask that it be um, published to the jury. Right. We're going to do it again. What, what, you said 1246? 1246. All right. Okay. It, it, it's in evidence. I, there's supposed to be redactions, though. But okay. All right. That's it in 1246. All right. Um, so why don't we uh, blow up the intimate relationships section? Uh, there's intimate relationships here uh, relative to a variety of people, um, including a, a person called Tasha. 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 Uh, who's she? Um, she was Miss Hurd's wife. Okay. And that, that relationship uh, preceded her relationship with Mr. Depp? That's correct. Did you say on direct that you saw no previous interpartner violence? Just yes or no? I don't believe I did. No. You don't believe that you saw inter partner violence or you didn't say it on direct? I don't believe I said that yesterday. Okay. Your Honor, can we approach? All right. Yes, sir.
Did you speak with Ms. Hurd around the circumstances that gave rise to the um, TRO? With, um, on May 21st? Yes. Um, yes, I did. Okay. Did Ms. Hurd ever tell you that James Franco spent the night with her at the ECB between May 21 and May 27? I recall, I mean, again, it would be helpful to have my notes so I can tell you exactly what, but I do recall that she did see him at some point. I do not know if he spent the night. Do you know if Elon Musk spent the night during that period? I don't know. You cannot testify that Johnny Depp was not abused, can you? I, I can testify that he had physical acts of violence perpetrated on him as well as psychological aggressive acts perpetrated upon him. No further questions. All right, redirect. Dr. Hughes, you were asked about some presentations. I think Plaintiff's 1241 was the first one. If we can bring that up. Tom, could you help me out with that? 1241? Yes. And if you can scroll down, what was the significance of this presentation? And, and can you can you give her control, or do you have to have control of the document? It's, it's just one page. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not the entire presentation. Okay, can you please tell the jury what you provided in this presentation? Um, to the best of my recollection, it was what I spoke to you about before of how people who are not trained in forensic psychology, but who are working with victims of domestic violence can go into court and navigate with the court system and present and talk about domestic violence in a, a legal setting. Okay, thank you. And that's been moved into admission, that's been moved that's in, moved. correct? Yes. Okay, well let's go to the one that I don't think was, 1242 please. Tom, if you could bring that up. All right, and is that just one page too? How many pages is that one? Okay. Um, do you recall this presentation, Dr. Hughes? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, could you please just, well, let's, I'm going to move the admission of Plaintiff's Exhibit 1242, first of all. Any objection? No. All right, 1242. Okay. And um, could we publish it to the jury, please? Yes, and Dr. Hughes, could you please tell the jury, explain to the jury what this presentation entailed? Um, so I was asked by the head of the Kings County Bar Association to give a presentation about uh, intimate partner violence, domestic violence, and how psychological experts can be of assistance. Um, this was um, just because of how Brooklyn is, a, a bar association that was attended by many of the prosecutors from the Kings County uh, District Attorney's Office as well as defense attorneys. And as I stated before, this presentation was about how to really understand cases of domestic violence, how to understand what if she drops the restraining order, what if she doesn't call the police, what are the myths and misconceptions about intimate partner violence, um, and when she uses force, what does that mean? How do we understand that? How do we evaluate for that? 
Um, so again, without seeing the rest of the presentation, I believe that was the thrust of this presentation. Okay, great. Thank you. Now, uh, you testified about the notes you took and the notes you reviewed, um, and you were asked about some limited questions on testing. I'm going to ask for Defendant's Exhibit 1434. No, oh, oh, no, no. Oh, I need, we need, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Sam. But you were doing a fine job, Tom. I didn't mean to take it away from you. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. Uh, Dr. Hughes, is this your CV? Yes, it is. All right, I'm going to move the admission of, of defendants 1434. You're out of completeness. They've got all the other records in here for Dr. Hughes. I'm trying to see completeness. I understand. I'll sustain the objection. Okay. Next question. Let's go to uh, defendants 1435, please. Now, Dr. Hughes, you, you've testified about the different uh, 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 testings that you administered, and this is one of the ones that I believe you testified to earlier, correct? That's correct. And this is the DSM-5? Um, this is the clinician-administered PTSD scale for the DSM-5. Okay. Um, I'm going to move the admission of 1435. Any objection? Any objection that it has a lot of other documents in it, not just the CAP SWAT? It's not the CAP SWAT. It's the DSM-5. But, but she administered all these tests, Your Honor, and they can't, for completeness of record, they can't put in partials and then not have the rest of it. Um, I think well, they, I mean, there was no objection to when they put theirs in. Now, I would now say, they're objecting to you putting. I, I, I would say rule of completeness, Your Honor, rule two, Virginia rule 2, colon 106, um, that they can't just put a partial in and then not, not have the completeness of the testing in the documents. Well, you, they put the... Their test in now. You want to put more tests in, correct? Co correct. But th that's not a completeness argument. Then that's just a different test. Well, it's, all, it's also but what's the objection though? That there's. Okay. All right. I'll sustain the objection. Next question. All right. Well, then we'll go for the other ones. Um, you did the TSI. What well, before we go on to the others? L let's talk about. Could you please tell the jury what you administered in this DSM five and why this is significant? Sustain. Can you tell us why the DSM-5 is significant that you administered? So the, the DSM-5 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychiatric Disorders. It's published by the American Psychiatric Association. That's where it has all the criteria and all the information for our major mental disorders like major depressive disorder or panic disorder or PTSD. What the CAPS is, the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale, is it follows all of that criteria that's in the DSM-5 so that you can make a very accurate diagnosis. And what, if any, diagnosis did you make as a result of this DSM-5? Right. So not only on this, I mean, this instrument can stand alone where she meets PTSD criteria just by virtue of this instrument, <clears throat> pardon me, but also the, the other testing that I gave where she had elevated scales on PTSD measures which correspond with the DSM-5 symptoms of PTSD. So there were multiple measures that are consistent across time that she meets criteria for PTSD. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Now, you were also given one page of the scoring on the TSI-2 uh, and one page with respect to the PAI. Do you recall seeing that? Uh, it wasn't the scoring. They were the critical items on those respective tests. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask to bring up Defendant's Exhibit 1858. Which is the full PAI. Um, and was this the actual testing and scoring? 
Um, yes, this is the, the profile, um, the scores that are generated from the 344 questions that Ms. Hurd uh, answered on this test. And, and what did you, what were the results, what, what did you determine based on the testing of this PAI? Well, that the results were valid and reportable. Um, there was no evidence of exaggeration or malingering on this test, and there were significant symptoms um, that correspond with traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress disorder symptomatology. And I, I believe you said again that there was um, that there was no elevated scores. Can you explain to the jury what you meant by that? Objection leading. O overruled up. Go ahead. So elevated scores are a, a way that we get to know where a cutoff is to say that something is clinically significant, and that follows very um, standard statistical principles. So when a scale is elevated, it means that we have sort of greater confidence that this individual endorsed a lot of different symptoms that make this scale relevant, and then we want to figure out why um, that person is having an elevated score on something like depression or anxiety. Um, it gives us greater confidence that, you know, this person's maybe reporting depressive symptoms like people who are depressed. Okay. And what, what would constitute an elevated score? Well, on different tests, it's different things. Um, certainly on the PAI, um, it, it doesn't follow linear T-scores. It's a little different statistically, so you have to look at it differently. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, it's usually about a T-score of a 65 and on some, it's a T-score of a 70, which is a, a T-score is a normative curve, is a way of allowing us to compare people's scores, comparing your scores to the normative group of scores. Okay. And would it be at all helpful to have the entire uh, test as opposed to a, a one piece of paper or, or one page? Well, certainly you cannot tell the entirety of how um, the symptoms that Ms. Hurd endorsed and the scales were elevated just by the critical items. All right. I'm going to move the admission of plaintiff's ex or defendant's exhibit 1858. Objection here, sir. And this is the completeness, Your Honor. I'll sustain the objection. Next question. Let's bring up 1859. And this is, you were shown one page from the TSI-2, the Trauma Symptom Inventory 2. Do you recall that? Correct. Okay. What is the significance of the TSI-2 exam, the full exam? The Trauma Symptom Inventory is a test of common symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and related traumatic symptomatology. And um, on this score, she had, you know, elevations in intrusive experiences, which is the um, intrusive component of PTSD where thoughts or memories or feelings come into your mind when you don't want them with accompanying distress and then the defensive avoidance doing many many different things to push it down to try not to think about it to try not to talk about it um, so that you don't get upset um, and she also scored high on a scale of relational avoidance having difficulty feeling close in relations and uh, relationships not only intimate relationships but friendships as well and um, that's a related trauma symptom that individuals have after having sustained um, an interpersonal trauma like domestic violence. Okay. And would it be helpful to have the full exam as opposed to one page out of it? As with anything, seeing a, an entire uh, profile gives one more information. Your Honor, I'd move the admission of Defendant's Exhibit 15 for 1859. Objection hearsay. Yeah. And I would argue the complete rule again. For this.
Dr. Hughes, you were asked, you were shown a couple of finger pictures um, of Mr. Depp. And I believe you indicated that those were shown to you, and I think you were asked uh, if you were, uh, if these were severe injuries, correct? Correct. All right. Did you have any understanding of the cause of those injuries by Mr. Depp? I do understand that there's competing accounts of what happened, for sure. All right. Let's bring up Defendant's Exhibit 373. Your Honor, I think this is already admitted. Uh, I don't see it, and Jamie doesn't have it, so 373, I can mark it, but it's not admitted yet. I think there was Unless a version of that. If well, I, may, I don't know that. Your Honor, I can just tell you that 373 has not been admitted into evidence. Your Honor, it's not redacted, and I don't okay. believe it's been admitted. It, it, the, the part I'm trying to admit is in another exhibit, so let's let's go in a different way. We'll take that one down. Let's go with 398. 398 redacted is in evidence. That's That might be the one. All right. If you could... Lower that up. And I think we're looking for, if you could move that up, Michelle. There we go. If you could blow that one up. And this is an email from Mr. Depp to David Kipper, his your understanding was that was his doctor, correct? Correct. Okay. And then I'm going to draw your attention to the last part of this. And this is on 319, 2015. Thank you for everything. I want to figure out how to do this. I'm missing the controls on this. Thank you for everything. I've chopped off my left middle finger as a reminder that I should thank you, Your Honor, that I should never cut off my finger again. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay, so that's Mr. Depp admitting that to Dr. Kipper in 319, 2015. Objection leading. Okay. I sustain the objection next. Okay, that's, that's fine. I, I'm good with that. Um, let's go to Defendant's Exhibit 499. Your Honor, I believe this one is in as well, or is it a, is it the redacted? It's a redacted one. Yes, that's okay. the one. Thank you. Uh, and then if I could draw your attention, this is a, a text message from Mr. Depp to Erin Falati. We talked about her earlier on 10-31-2015. And says, this is the second time he's held off giving me my meds by blackmailing me into seeing him. The first time, I had just chopped my finger off. Do you recall seeing that as part of the documents that you reviewed? Mm, I believe I did. Okay, thank you. We can take that down. Now, you were also asked to listen to an audio tape, and it's Plaintiff's 343. I'm going to, and, and, and do you recall here listening to that audio tape at some point as part of your review? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, I'm going to now pull up that same audio tape from the same date, and I believe that's June 2016. And if we could go to, and we're going to have a few different ones, so so hold in there with us. We're going to start with two minutes, 40 seconds, zero, zero going to 2 minutes, 40 seconds, and 21.
knocking on your door. I don't because get why I wanted to Because that is a fucking irrational and violent fucking maneuver. How so a man would want to get out of that area so that he doesn't get so fucking angry that he actually does pop the fucking wife. Uh, I have one in front of me. Oh, man. Go home and listen to the tape. Now, that was just before the punching, hitting that was played. Do you recall that? Objection leaving. Well, uh, the, the tape recording that you listened to was at 2 colon 4601 to 247, 2 colon 4720, and that was 2 colon 40 through 2 colon 4021. Correct? I understand. Objection yes. leaving. Okay. Now let's go oh, to after oh, Overruled. That. Go ahead. Thank you. Now let's go to after that, 2 colon 52. Zero zero to two colon fifty two thirty four. Yesterday, because of how it's been lately, like since Australia, and I have been on the road with you. I haven't been working. I don't know what else I could fucking do. Since Australia, you've been on the road with me. You had a great time on the road. You had a bike ride with Charlie. You had a bike ride with Charlie. Yeah. Physical. And then let's go to three colon twenty zero zero to three colon twenty one thirty seven. And while they're getting that, I'll just ask you the question, Dr. Hughes. Do you recall that Mr. Depp said that they had fights in the places that he listed on that audio tape? Objection leading. Sustained. All right. <laughs> What do you recall Mr. Depp saying about fights that they'd had on that audio tape? Um, Objection, I, no foundation. She just listened to oh, it. Oh, okay. yeah. I've, um, I think it was hard to hear in this one. I had listened to it previously, um, just acknowledging that there were fights previously. Okay, thank you. Do you recall listening to that part of the tape, the audio I, tape? Yes, I do. And, and what do you recall from that portion? Again, I know it's hard to hear, but... It's hard to hear, but um, what I recall from hearing that was the, the, the negotiation that the couple is trying to do and, and trying to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to do my part, I'm going to do better. Okay. Is it possible to turn that up anymore, or is it, I have one more, I'm just... Thank you, Jamie. Okay, my last one is three colon twenty six twenty to three colon twenty nine fifty. Your Honor, can we approach? 
Okay, yes sir. What are we going to do different in the moment when you're mad and you go fuck it and you in decide moment. all bets are off? In the moment, look what I did in Australia. Look what I accomplished. I put the fucker away. I told myself every fucking day, no, he's gone. No, he's not fucking put him away. Put him away. And by a list. I feel that fuck you over or make you feel shitty or anything like that. I fucking, when we're in the moment, I remember it. I remember what I put on my list. I remember it. And I try to, 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 to bring it down notches, many notches. I'll tr tr try, if we're, if we're heightened, to say, I'm not, I need to know what we need to do different. I need to know. It's gotta be done with your mind and your heart. What do we do different if well, I have a problem? You no. need to tell me how to tell you different if I'm hurting you. You need to let me be able to be mad. Sometimes you're gonna make me mad. I'm a human. I cannot live where it's like. Well, then it's the same thing goes for me then. You're gonna have to allow me to get mad. Yes, exactly. If okay, I do something that makes you mad. You start I, 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 I don't have to start yelling. I think I start yelling once it gets fucking heightened. I've gotten a lot better about that. It's just only, no, I only start no. yelling when it's fucking hour 11 and we're really in it. I'm just talking about the yelling. are gone. Did you put him away? It's been so, when you get on that train, you get angry, you stay on it for so long, and you won't come down, you won't talk to the person that's that not, is you. That's not always, that's not always. It doesn't have to always be the monster, but what is it? Can you put that away? Can you remember the bigger picture? You don't want to spend your life. I've asked you this so many times in fights. You want to spend your time like this. No, you don't, but I ask you because this is something you're choosing. I'm saying to you, olive branch. And you don't take my olive branches. You made me feel humiliated for offering them. You asked me to stay in Australia. I stayed, and then you walk out on me all the time. You've got to take some olive branches from me. You've got to offer them, too. You've got to be bigger than what you feel at that moment. And so do I. So do I. But if I call you on it, will you hear it? You call me out on it if I'm doing it. Do you remember listening to that, Dr. Hughes? Yes, I do. And, and what is your interpretation of that? What do you recall? Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. She, she's an expert. Uh, overruled. I, I think this is more of the, how this couple is trying to negotiate in the face of all of the um, the turmoil and the violence and the abuse. Um, I think it's important pointing out is my recollection is that there's two Australias. They're talking about the honeymoon Australia, not the honey, not the Australia where the incident happens. They go back, and that becomes a honeymoon time for them. Um, and I think certainly hearing how this couple has talked about the monster. And, and the person who comes out, as we talked about, that cycle of violence where the person who, you know, hurts her and hits her and, and controls her isn't the same person that she, she loves and she cares about and that she wants to be with. 
Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Now, we, they, you also were asked about Dr. Bonnie Jacobs and uh, her treatment and her treatment notes. Uh, and you did you review those treatment notes from Bonnie Jacobs? Yes, I did. I'm going to ask you to turn to, can we bring up defendants 1059? And do you recognize these, this document? Yes. Okay. And what is it? Um, this looks like the first of Dr. Bonnie Jacobs' uh, treatment notes starting in October 17th, 2011. Okay. And do you recall whether Ms. Hurd was already in a relationship with Mr. Depp at that time? Um, yes, she was. Okay. And you testified quite extensively yesterday about Bonnie Jacobs notes and, and entries there uh, were those reflected in these notes these were the notes Objection that I leading your honor I can ask it differently and what if any uh, of those uh, citations that you gave to the jury were in these notes objection compound uh, overruled okay. um, these were the notes that I was referring to okay. yesterday a and what was the significance of these notes to you? You were asked again about them on cross. I, again, I found the, the treatment notes very significant because they had contemporaneous reports of what Ms. Hurd was going through, not only what she was reporting in her relationship with Mr. Depp, but her accompanying symptomatology. Um, what the notes revealed was there was a significant amount. Well, we see it unfold in time. We see where the violence starts and we see how it unfolds. We see at least three indications of, of sexual assaults. We see constant um, pleadings and, and, and upset about his substance abuse and trying to find ways to get him help. And she joins Al-Anon to get herself help as a family member of someone who struggles with substance abuse. We see how she's reporting a lot of controlling behavior and obsessive behavior. Um, we see that there's two instances where the police were going to be called and when in her apartment in Orange um, because of the fighting um, at that time once they actually were called and once they weren't from what I can amass from the notes. So what it does is it really shows how this relationship is unfolding over time and actually getting worse. And then you indicated that Amber Heard moved from Bonnie Jacobs to uh, Dr. Cohen and that was in 2014, is that correct? Correct. Okay, and what is your understanding of the relationship between Dr. Cowan and Dr. Kipper? Um, they were professional colleagues and they were friends and um, Dr., I mean, well, it's, it's understanding why Ms. Hurd left the relationship with Bonnie Jacobs. It, was, it became a tumultuous relationship for her there because she was doing a lot to um, protect Johnny and Bonnie Jacobs had concerns. Objection, Your Honor. What's the objection? No foundation. I, I established the foundation. She she reviewed the notes and she interviewed Bonnie Jacobs. I'll, I'll overrule the foundation objection. Go ahead. Objection non-responsive. I'll overrule non-responsive. Please continue, Dr. Hughes. Um, the reason that um, Ms. Hurd left her treatment with Bonnie Jacobs were one that Mr. Depp continued to denigrate that relationship, her therapeutic, therapeutic relationship. But number two, really more importantly, is that she wanted to protect Mr. Depp because she didn't want, Ms. Dr. Jacobs had some concerns about perhaps his substance using in front of his children and that she would be a mandated reporter. Um, so Ms. Hurd did not want to do anything and talk more about what was going on with Mr., um, about Mr. Depp with her therapist for fear that um, something might happen. So she left that treatment really to protect uh, Mr. Depp. Yeah, I'd like to move the admission of uh, Defendant's Exhibit 1059, the treatment notes. Objection here, say, Your Honor, this is what we dealt with yesterday. Your Honor, I, I think that the, for completeness here, she has relied upon these and they reflect the present sense impressions. I'll sustain the objection to hearsay. All right. Let's go to Defendant's Exhibit 1057, please. And Dr. Hughes, you also indicated that you relied on the treatment notes of Dr. Uh, Co 
Conan, correct? Cohen. Co Connell Cohen. Cohen, yes. That's it. Okay. And and you also interviewed him as well? Correct. Okay. And and on what what was the significance of what he reported to you that related to your opinions? Well, this was a continuation of her treatment and the treatment here where it seemed like Dr. Connell Cohen was going was a harm reduction model, really trying to um, help Amber stay safe in the relationship by not talking back, by leaving, by not engaging. Um, and those are very sort of short-term strategies when you're in uh, a relationship mired with interpersonal violence. Um, what we also see is what I mentioned yesterday is um, I mean, her psychological status and functioning <clears throat> continues to deteriorate. She continues to have more anxiety, more affect dysregulation, sort of feelings are coming up and down all the time. Um, she's having more sleep problems. She's going on more medication. Um, and the sort of the conceptualization and understanding of that is, you know, sort of exposure to repeated trauma causes psychological disequilibrium and destabilization. Um, and that's, we're sort of, again, seeing the trauma unfold over time. And also in these notes, I mean, certainly there are those contemporaneous reports um, that correspond to specific incidents, like I was speaking with you yesterday about the Boston plane incident. There are actual notes where she called him after objection, your she Honor. called yes. him. What's the objection? Beyond the scope of the question. I, I, right. I think I'll sustain objection. the objection. Next question. Okay. Um, what, if any, uh, additional information did you get from Dr. Cowan that assisted you in your opinions? Um, well, certainly from the notes, as I was stating, that, you know, there were times where right after an incident, you know, Ms. Hurd wrote, um, she contacted Dr. Cohen either by text or by email and saying, you know, Johnny did a number on me tonight. I really need to see you. Um, I'm safe. I'm Objection hurt, but I'm hearsay. Safe. I, I think she can rely on hearsay. Sustain the objection to hearsay. Well, Your Honor, I'm, I'm going to uh, move the admission of uh, the notes, uh, defendants 1057. Objection, hearsay, Your Honor. Sustain the objection. Thank I'm you. Move to strike the hearsay testimony as well. No, we'll continue on. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, you were asked about a knife. You were shown Plaintiff's Exhibit 92 and a knife that's, uh, I think, is till death. What is your understanding of the significance of that knife and that phrase as it related to Amber Heard? Uh, objection, Your Honor, no foundation. He, was, he showed it in cross-examination. I'm, I'm able to ask about it and what her understanding was. He cut her off when she was trying to talk. I'm just letting her go back in. Her understanding of a knife? <laughs> Let, let's pull up Plaintiff's 92. Tom, can I get you to do that, please? I believe you, in response to the questions asked by counsel for Mr. Depp, you said it depends upon what the context is. What did you mean by that? Well, if, first, I believe that this is the knife that has a turquoise end, um, and this was when a time when uh, Mr. Depp was filming The Lone Ranger, and he was in a, a turquoise phase, um, and she purchased him that because she thought it would be um, a kind gift. Um, the phraseology is that Mr. Depp told her the only way out of this relationship is death. Okay. Objection what, hearsay. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand the objection. I think she was, she was entitled to be able to speak to that. But she, it, it, yeah, it's Mr. Depp's statement, the party right, opponent admission. I'll the objection. Thank you. Okay. Um, it, it, and what is your uh, opinion, uh, how, what, what do you think of that as a, a clinical psychologist in specializing in IPV and trauma? I mean, Objection, Your Honor. Can I, uh, can we okay. approach? Sure.
Dr. Hughes, do you think that the phraseology on the knife uh, bears any relationship or significance to the opinions you've had in this case? Objection, Your Honor. Leading. Sustained objection. What, if any, significance does the phraseology on the knife uh, have in, to the opinions you have provided in this case? Objection, Your Honor, beyond the scope of the disclosure. That's a, that, he brought it up in cross. I'll overrule the objection. Thank you. Um, so there are several things. I, I certainly am aware that at this time that um, Ms. Hurd purchased this knife for um, Mr. Depp. She was um, engaged in a, her whole lot of denial and minimization about the extent of the violence in the relationship. Um, there is a notation in, in Dr. Bonnie Jacobs notes about um, when Mr. Depp uttered this to her um, was under the, around the discussions of the prenup. And he said, I don't want one because the only way out of this relationship is death. Um, Dr. Jacobs didn't think that that was funny. Miss Hurd was taking it like, oh, maybe it's endearing, maybe this is okay, um, but it was definitely a, a clinical cause of concern um, at the time um, that that phraseology was used. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Now, you were, you listened to an audio tape and then we showed some additional ones from that. Uh, what, if any, photos did you review as part of your examination? Objection beyond the scope of cross. He was asking all the different authority. I'm just establishing that she also looked at photos. I'll, I'll sustain the objection. Okay. It's beyond the scope. Dr. Hughes, um, based on everything in the cross-examination and the redirect, what, if any, changes do you have to any of the opinions that you provided to this jury yesterday? I Objection don't compound. Overruled. I, I don't have any changes to my opinions that I gave yesterday. Okay. Um, and do you still hold those within a reasonable degree of psychological probability or certainty? Yes, I do. Thank you. I have no further questions. All right. Is this witness subject to recall? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Ma'am, you can't discuss your testimony with anybody, but you're free to stay in the courtroom since you base your on expert testimony, okay? Thank you, Your All right, Honor. thank you. All right, I think we'll go ahead. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, Judy. Um, let's go ahead and take our lunch break now. Um, just do not do any outside research and uh, don't talk to anybody about the case, okay? We'll see you back here too, okay? All right, we'll be back at two then. Secret All right, thank you.
Here we go. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Be seated. All right, your next witness. Your Honor, we'd like to call Laura Amber Heard to the stand. All right. Amber, Amber Laura. <laughs> she volunteer only All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Will you please state your name? Yes, it's Amber Laura Heard. And what is your address? I live in Yucca Valley, California. And how old are you, Amber? I am 36. I just celebrated. Okay. And do you have a daughter? I do. Uh, she also celebrated her birthday recently. She's one. Okay. And what is your profession? I am an actor, uh, mostly. Okay. Now, why are you here? I am here because my ex-husband is suing me uh, for an op-ed I wrote. And how do you feel about that? I, um, I st struggle to have the words. I struggle to find the words to describe how uh, painful this is. Um, this is horrible for me to sit here uh, for weeks and um, relive everything, um, hear people that I knew, um, some well, some not, my ex-husband with whom I shared a life. Um, speak um, about our lives in the way that they have. Um, this has been one of, the, this is the most painful and difficult thing I've ever gone through, for sure. Now, there was a trial in the UK in July of 2020 where Mr. Depp had sued the Sun newspaper and Dan Wooten. Do you recall that? Yes. Uh, and what was your level of participation in that lawsuit, in that trial? Well, I was uh, not party to that lawsuit. I was um, a witness, um, I, I suppose the primary witness, since it dealt with the truth of the relationship um, that I shared with Johnny. And what, if any, role did you have to play with respect to, for example, witness statements and testifying? Objection, compound. I said, for example. Uh, uh, overruled. I had to write, um, I think I gave seven witness statements um, under oath testimony. I sat on the stand. Um, for four days, um, under mostly cross-examination. And up until this point, it was the hardest thing I had ever had to do. Thank you, Amber. <clears throat> I'm gonna take you back, and if you can just tell the jury a little bit about your background, tell us where you grew up. I come from Austin, Texas, a small town outside of Austin that you probably haven't heard of, no one has. Um, it's called Maynard, okay. and uh, I was raised by my mother and my father, and I grew up with a little sister, although I have a big sister as well. 
And your little sister's name is? Uh, her name is Whit. Whit Hurd. And how, how much of an age difference is there between the two of you? Whitney and I are about one year, I think we're 16 months apart, so right next to each other. And what did your father do for a living? Uh, my father um, broke horses and did construction, had, um, he painted houses, um, and uh, hunted and fished, but that was for fun. And what did your mom do? She worked for the state of Texas. Um, let me just, since you talked about the breaking horses, can you just tell the jury what your role is in assisting your dad on that and what is involved in breaking horses? Objection leading. Can you just tell me about? Overruled, good. Um, you just got to stay on, basically. Uh, I, I would help him. I was more of a, a crash test dummy. You know, when you train a horse, you... It, it's a wild animal. It doesn't necessarily like to be um, ridden. And uh, there are people out there um, who are crazy enough, like my dad, to pick that as a profession, I guess. And he was really good with horses. And um, I was the son he never had. So it was my job to, you know, stay on. And what, if anything, did you learn from your father about how to react to the horses? Well, with training horses, um, I guess the key the the key things are to not show fear, not get intimidated, not show fear, be tough and calm. Tell the jury a little bit about your educational background during those growing up years and your work experience. Uh, I, I worked uh, any job that I could from the time I was really young. I wanted to get out of Texas and do something with my life and see things and do things. Um, so I was in school and really pushed myself to, I, I just always pushed myself to um, be able to accelerate the process. I wanted to, you know, get out of school as fast as I could and I wanted to do I wanted to do more things with my life than stay in Texas. So what types of things, so where did you go to school when you were um, younger? I was a scholarship kid at a Catholic school um, growing up, uh, several different Catholic schools, but they were always in the other, you know, on the other side of town, in the wealthier part of town. And um, I grew up quite um, working class and, uh, and, and thankfully with, um, you know, as long as I maintained an A average, I, uh, I, I enjoyed the benefit of a scholarship. And I did that until I realized that I could take my GED and SATs early. And I did that and placed out of school and effectively left school uh, at 16 years old, I believe. And what did you do for work during those younger years? I took any job that I could. I worked at my father's construction company, sometimes, um, you know, just administrative stuff. I mean, it was a small company. Um, but I answered phones, and I uh, worked at, a, like, a modeling agency that was also, you know, um, offered photography classes, makeup classes, hair, hair and makeup classes for people that were pursuing a career in entertainment. And I uh, started taking um, classes that I paid for by working there, effectively as a trade. Uh, and I eventually worked there long enough to be able to pay for my headshots, which are the pictures that you use in the industry to promote yourself, you know, in, in whatever, acting, modeling, or both. Okay. And <clears throat> what, if any, charitable work did you do when you were still young? It started off as a, a requirement for the school I went to, and then I liked it so much, I think, because it, it meant I wasn't at home, and that was important to me, is just to not spend time at home. Uh, and I, um, I, really, I really loved meeting people, so I worked at the soup kitchen every morning before school, um, during the school year. 
uh, for about four years. There were, I didn't go on weekends, um, but on weekends I would do um, various things, worked at children's, um, like at children's uh, museums typically, because they would work with younger volunteers. Um, and mostly soup kitchens and things involving children. I worked at the um, with deaf kids for a while, and uh, yeah, I I love it. And when you worked with the deaf kids, what if anything did you do to learn to be able to work with them? Objection leading and four hundred four. And relevance, Your Honor. Oh. Overruled. Um, well, I I taught myself how to sign basic sign language, and then I um, I pursued it. I audited a, uh, a translate um, a course at the community college, which I ended up going to um, to get out of high school early um, later on, but I would audit classes. The teachers never wanted to kick the, you know, random 12-year-old out of their class, I suppose. So I remarkably was able to audit, uh, um, I think, the majority of two semesters, and that's also help, help me learn. <laughs> so how did you end up in Los Angeles? I use, I met, I did a, I did a small job in Texas uh, where I played a part in a movie and the actor in the movie that I was playing opposite had an agent visiting him from LA and I met her on set and she said that she had heard about me from another bit part I did. You know, I was taking jobs in Austin for really anything, to be an extra, to apply my, I did makeup once. I, um, you know, nothing, no job was too small or, you know, for me. So I, I put myself out there and she had heard about me and she said, I have heard about you in this town and I'd love to meet you in LA if you're ever out in LA and I was like, um, oh, when can I come? Uh, and she made up an appointment with me for the following week and I used all but $180 or something um, to get out there and that's, I landed, I didn't know anyone. Uh, I was 17 um, and I've effectively ever been there ever since, I suppose. So when you arrived in Hollywood, please tell the jury what you did to get moving there, get going. I uh, went to every audition, every casting, every meeting, every appointment that I could. I, I put myself out there. I didn't have a car um, because those were expensive. Um, so I took the bus around LA. It was before smartphones. I had a, a Thomas guide in my bag and a change of tank tops. Um, not that it mattered, but I went to about 10 auditions sometimes a day and would change clothes if I needed to in the back of you know the bus I was taking and I just hustled from one audition to the other. And uh, I got a bit part on one thing and then I got a bit part on another thing and then eventually m my roles kind of became more important or bigger and um, it's been a slow progression, I guess, since then, you know, of doing either tiny bit parts in bigger movies or doing, you know, larger roles in movies that no one would see. And I guess, you know, it still is kind of like that. So I'm going to ask you to go from 2002 to 2009. If you could just describe for the jury a little bit what types of parts you had, um, I think, They've indicated they didn't. You you have not been well known here uh, in this courtroom compared to Mr. Depp. So perhaps just take them through a little bit of that. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I did small roles in big films like you know, Zombie Land and um, Pineapple Express and uh, movies that were well known. Um, my first one was Friday Night Lights, uh, but again, I had small roles in those bigger films. And then I would do larger roles in um, kind of s smaller films. Like I brought, um, I did a project where I was the lead in a John Carpenter film and he came out of retirement to do that. And that's kind of the, how it was in terms of my career for those initial, that, that first initial 10 years or so. It was just 
going from slightly bigger role to slightly bigger role and just working my butt off. So I'm going to take you up to 2008. Did there come a time that you auditioned for The Rum Diary? Yes, I, um, I auditioned for that in about 2008, I believe. Please describe for the jury your experience in auditioning for The Rum Diary. Well, I auditioned a few times, which is common in my wanted to meet me in person. Um, I thought I would be going for maybe an audition, um, but it was just a meeting. I went to his office um, and, and met with him for a few hours. And what did you talk about during that, those few hours? We talked about books and music, poetry. Um, we like a lot of the same we liked a lot of the same stuff, you know, obscure writers and, you know, interesting books and pieces of poetry that I haven't heard anybody else reference or know or like. And he um, was very well read and charismatic. And, she, you know, I think I left the office with a few books that he gave me. And we spent the whole time just talking about things that we care about. And I was. I was so surprised that somebody, you know, I knew who he was. I wasn't familiar, you know, I wasn't a fan of his work. I wasn't familiar with him, but I knew who he was. You know, he's mo one of the most famous people in the world. So it was al already a weird thing to go and get called into his office. And, you know, I'm a no-name actor. I was 22, I think, and I thought it was unusual. <laughs> it was weird because he's, he was twice my age and he's this world famous actor and here we are getting along about obscure books and weird you know old blues and we just it, it was I thought it was remarkable you know I just hadn't really I thought it was unusual and remarkable I left there just feeling like wow so did there come a time that you learned that you were going to be cast for the role in The Rum Diary? Yes. A few days later, my agent um, said that Johnny's going to call you. We gave him your phone number. I was like, oh, okay. And shortly after, I my phone rings. I pick it up, and I hear, you know, this, like, deep voice on the other line. And he said, you got the, you know, you're it, kid. You're the... You're the dream. Hunter wrote this part, and you're the dream. You're it, kid. Like, and means. please describe for the jury what that means. What what was the Rome Diary and this Hunter Thompson? What what was the concept here, and what role were you playing? Um, well, it was my understanding that he was bringing to life a, his late friend, and what he told me was that this character is supposed to be the dream woman, like the dream, American dream. And um, so I knew what he meant. He indicated to me when he told me I got the role that I was, I was that, you know, that he, I was the dream kid. That's what he said. So did there come a time that you started filming The Rum Diary? Yes, I'm not quite sure how much I think we started filming in maybe March of 2009. And where did you film The Rum Diary? We shot it in Puerto Rico. Um, and describe, if you can, the events of the filming and your interactions with Mr. Depp during that time. It was a bit surreal, you know, uh, filming in a place like Puerto Rico. It was beautiful. Um, it takes place in the 50s, so everything really looked beautiful, you know, cars and clothing, the music, it was just, it was a very colorful um, shoot in general. I, I, I couldn't have asked for, you know, a, a, a better scenario. I, I, I was on, on film, I mean, I was on set um, reading my books and every, occasionally Johnny would talk to me and then he started to be really kind to me, uh, m like more open with me uh, when we'd have hot days filming, it, you know, there'd be this big SUV pull up and a security guard would kind of usher me into this car and it would have the AC blasting 
and I'd be <laughs> sitting in the back of the SUV just thinking what a strange experience the whole thing was. And, you know, we didn't really have a whole lot of interaction on set until, um, until we did a scene that involved um, kissing. We, we had a kissing scene and it didn't feel like a normal, it didn't feel like a normal scene anymore. It felt, um, it felt more real. There are certain things that you do in the job to um, be professional, like when you have to do that sort of scene and you don't like, you, <laughs> You don't use your tongue if you can't, if you can avoid it. There's certain things that you do to just maintain a certain line, and it just felt like those lines were blurred. I mean, he grabbed my face and pulled me into him and really kissed me. Did, but we were filming a scene. Did he use his tongue? Yes. Okay. Did your birthday, did you celebrate your birthday while you were in Puerto Rico? I did. I celebrated maybe my 23rd birthday there. And what, if anything, did Mr. Depp do for your birthday? Well, we were already kind of talking about books and poetry and things like that. He gave me a few really beautiful poetry books. And uh, he gave me a bicycle, uh, like a vintage bicycle, because at the time I was riding around and on a bike and, and I had a lot of time off since I was a smaller role in the movie. And, um, yeah, I think that was it. Okay. Now, did there come a time that um, you ended up visiting him in his trailer? Yes. Um, I think there was a, we would hang out if, you know, after or in between scenes or in between setups, we often were, you know, talking about things and would continue the conversation into the trailer, um, often with the director, Bruce Robinson was his name. Um, and then at one point, we, we talk about wine. It's another thing that Johnny and I shared in common, a love for uh, wine, red wine. Uh, and we were talking about um, a kind of wine that I enjoyed, and I was you know, going on about how great this bargain wine was. And I didn't understand you know, how much more sophisticated Johnny's taste in wine was. Um, so I was going on about the virtues of Malbec or something, and I brought him a bottle of this wine and I set it down and at some point I'm, I'm, I'm going back to get back to set and he kind of kicked his like, you know, foot up in the air and basically kind of lifted the back of my bathrobe up and... Can I just stop you there? Why were you wearing a bathrobe? Because I was doing a scene, um, it was a period film so it uh, took place in the 50s and so I had all of this um, old undergarments that are for that time era um, on. And the scene involved me changing. Um, so I had all the, the costume on. And he kind of picked up the back of my robe with his boot. And I kind of turned around and like laughed, like giggled, you know. Um, it, I wasn't, I didn't feel I just didn't, like, I didn't know what to make of it at the time, and it just kind of, I just kind of giggled and batted it away playfully, and uh, he, he kind of playfully kind of pushed me down on this, like, bed sofa uh, that was in his trailer, just playful um, and flirtatious, and he said, uh, yum, and he kind of, like, lifted up his eyebrows like that, and I just giggled, l laughed it off, kind of batted him away, and, you know, moved on, went back to set. And were you in a relationship at that time? I was. Okay. And was Mr. Depp in a relationship at that time? That was my understanding, yeah. Okay. Uh, and did anything else of significant happen during that, that time period while you were filming with Mr. Depp, other than what you've told us? We just had this... You know, it, it was a friendship, a flirtatious thing. We, I felt chemistry. I felt this other thing that was that went beyond the pale of my job, for sure. Uh, Johnny 
clearly felt that way about me, had indicated to me that that's how he felt in many different ways. And But at the same time, that's, it, you know, we were both in relationships and it is a job and, you know, I, it was intimidating. And I, I just remember feeling kind of intimidated and a little nervous about that. And I also was in a relationship. So we went our separate ways and we didn't hear, I didn't hear from him for a long time. And, and that's so approximately how long were you filming in Puerto Rico for the Rome Diary? A few months is my best. All guess. right. And when you left Puerto Rico in the filming, when is the next time that you had any contact from Mr. Depp? And contact could include a anything, uh, uh, communications, written communications, uh, as well as uh, telephone or otherwise. Uh, we had no contact until uh, Johnny called me on the phone one day, and I was driving, and he invited me over to his home in in California, I mean Beverly Hills, and I um, I was out of the blue. I didn't even have his phone number, um, so I was it was quite unexpected. Uh, he called me a second time, but I I don't think we actually connected, or we didn't stay on the phone um, because. We did well. Yeah, we didn't really speak. But the first time was the only time I actually spoke to him, and he invited me over to his house uh, under kind of the. He said that you know we could get Bruce, who was the director, uh, to come over. Something about the movie, but it was clearly not about the movie. If you know what I mean, it was. So I said, um, I, I said my friends are in town, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm busy with that, and kind of hung up, feeling really. Startled, you know, that didn't know what else to do. What if any gifts did Mr. Depp send you during that time period after you filmed The Rum Diary? Uh, he sent me several gifts. He sent me a beautiful dress, uh, one that I wore in the movie, uh, with a beautiful handwritten note said, Happy Wrapping, and um, made a reference to the dress being wrapping paper. Uh, he sent me a few gorgeous, expensive, what I can only assume are expensive, um, collectible books, uh, items. Uh, and then when I was away filming on a different, you know, a different job, he uh, attempted, or he did send me um, some guitars. Uh, I know one delivery, I was informed about one delivery, um, and I, my partner at the time uh, intercepted the, the, the attempt to, to deliver and called me immediately and said, what should I do? And I said, well, send, I said, send it back. And she did. And sh she indicated that there was, at the time, that there was another one that had already previously attempted delivery, and it was also rejected. We sent it, I sent it back because I wasn't there, and I wouldn't have accepted it anyway. Okay. Did there come a time that you ended up having to go on a press tour for the Rum Diary? We, I got a call for the Rum Diary press tour in the fall of 2011. So that's close to two, two and a half years after you filmed? Um, I'm an actress, not a mathematician <laughs> for a reason. They, they, roughly, yes. Okay. And um, could you please describe for the jury what a press tour is? Just explain it to them. Well, you take a... A movie once it's completed and uh, if it doesn't have distribution you as part of the promotion of that movie you go to these various places normally cities um, like London or New York and you do press events in those cities to kind of promote the film and you go to place to place talking about the film and so you were then called to participate in the press tour for the Rome Diary uh, yes, I had um, just, I was going, I had just finished going through the process of uh, separation with my former partner, and I was moving and going through that, and I got a phone call saying, remember that movie you did in Puerto Rico? Well, they want you for the press tour, and I said, well, perfect timing, uh, <laughs> and we did that, I think, October, late October 2011. So describe for the jury your interactions with Mr. Depp during the press tour. Well, on the first stop of the, well, 
first stop, the beginning of the tour was Los Angeles where we both li lived and we did a press day, normal press day. And then at the end of it, uh, I was invited uh, by Johnny to come up to his room to have a drink with uh, him and the director uh, of the film. And I went up to the room um, to see both him and Bruce. Um, but as soon as I got there, Johnny said Bruce wasn't going to make it. So I stayed. Johnny and I started talking. Uh, I told, he asked me about my relationship. I said, well, you know, I'm going, I'm going through it. Um, I'm going through the separation right now and it's been, you know, rough couple of months, but that's normal. And he said, well, that's same with, same with me. You know, it's been, I, I can't remember exactly how long he said it had been, but that he had split from the mother of his kids and uh, said that he understood. Right, and then what happened next? Uh, then we drank red wine and continued to talk, and the talking became us, you know, uh, reconnect. You know, it was like reconnection was almost instant. Um, it was just chemistry. It's hard to explain that, but we sat on the couch and we talked, and um, you know, it, it felt like there was. Uh, it, it felt like there was an electricity to the room and it's how I felt when I was alone with him anyway and it was instant again I was like whoa so uh, on the on the couch we we talked finished some wine and then I got up and left and as I went to leave uh, he grabbed both sides of my face uh, similar to what he did in 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 Puerto Rico when we were filming that that scene and he kissed me and I kissed him back. And what happened next with respect to any relationship with Mr. Depp? Well, then we fell in love. Uh, we went on this press tour and we went, it, it, was, it was a beautiful and strange time. You know, we went from, we we're flying from one, not together, but you know, going from one city to the next, Europe, um, New York, Los Angeles, as I said, and we're just traveling around talking about this movie that we did together, that we participated in together, and we were falling in love. I mean, it was just, you know, at the first dinner in London, he s sat me next to me. You know, he produced the film and was a part of controlling the film and was responsible for different things than I was as a small, as an actor having a small part in it. And um, we went on this press tour and I think in London he sat, had me sat next to him at this at a dinner, and then we ended up spending the night together in my hotel room. And for the rest of the press tour, we were it, it was on. I, I'll put it that way. All right. And how long approximately did the press tour go? I don't know exactly how long it lasted. Uh, I think, you know, there were uh, press engagements in this city for a few days and then another city for a few days. And then there was a break and then, then there was another press opportunity, I believe. So it was kind of spread out over, a, over maybe a month, if I'm guessing. So when you returned to Los Angeles, what, if anything, took place with any relationship with Mr. Depp? Well, once we were back from the press tour, you know, we had this, you know, whirlwind romance kind of just in these like beautiful places all over and we're falling in love and not able to really show it because um, he wasn't, that the world didn't know about the split between he and his former partner. And of course, um, as a woman, I was like, is that troubling you know and I would ask him he, no you know he swore to me that they hadn't even shared a bed for a year and that they were but they were protecting the kids and not publicizing it so or not making it known to the press and so we kind of had to be a little bit under the radar not a little bit we had to be really under the radar um, because as Johnny pointed out that the world would blame me um, and call me a homewrecker uh, even though I had nothing to do with it
so we were secretly dating and then you know it was it was it was beautiful it it was um i felt like this man knew me and saw me in a way that no one else had i felt he understood me i felt he understood where i came from i i felt like i felt that like when i was around johnny i felt like the most beautiful person in the whole world you know it made me feel seen made me feel like a million dollars and that kind of feeling where you know he just lavish gifts and lavish expressions of love and how he had never met a woman like me i mean i remember he took the foil off of the off of this uh bottle and put it on my ring finger and i had only been with him like days you know or maybe maybe it was weeks at the time yeah it was probably about a few weeks but it just felt very intense but we weren't doing normal life stuff we weren't like stuck in traffic with each other. We weren't going to the grocery store and doing life. We were like hiding in these places around the world. He had a lot of, he has so many homes. And so we'd be in one of those homes or my home at the time. And it would be like a bubble, like a, like we were in this little bubble of secrecy and it felt like a warm glow, as we would say. Just music and, and, and the kind of, books that we both loved and poetry that we both knew by heart and it it was um it felt like an it felt like a, a dream it felt like absolute magic so while you're dating i take it you're dating at this point right yes yeah, so you're falling, clear, while you're fall, yeah. falling in love you're also dating right okay yes um did there come a time early on that you ended up going to his Bahamas Island? Yes. Uh, so shortly after, you know, we, I think started dating October of 2011. And, um, the, you know, as I mentioned, this bubble, you know, where he'd come over to my house and not leave for like three or four days, you know, just smoking cigarettes and playing music and reading poetry to me or painting me or, you know, just talking. Um, and then he would disappear. And there'd be just no way to get a hold of him, no way to contact him. At, at first, I didn't really think anything about it, but um, he disappeared uh, at one point uh, and then came back and said he was dealing with something, some health issue, and uh, would I join him in the Bahamas? And that I think that's when I learned he had an island. And I was on a trip with a, a friend of mine in Spain, and I it was for the holidays, and I kind of rerouted my trip to so I could come and land in L.A. instead of. I mean, landing in Miami instead of L.A. so I could go and meet him on the island. And he had uh, Keenan come and meet me on that um, on that trip, like in, in Miami. I get off one plane, get onto another, and go and join him on his private island. And uh, I noticed he was drinking Beck's and uh, tea, like lots of tea, like lots of tea. Uh, and I, I didn't foolishly think anything of it. Um, I just, you know, thought the man really seriously, I missed it before, but really, really loves tea. And we had this beautiful, I don't know, less than a week probably, um, trip in, in the Bahamas, a private island, beautiful sandy beaches. Scene, like, it's a scene that you just don't, I had never experienced anything like that. Um, it was a beautiful place, a beautiful time, and uh, we fell, um, I fell head over heels in love with this man. So after the Bahamas, I assume you came back, and we're talking, are we talking now early 2012? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So what were you doing work-wise while you were dating him in this early stage? What I always do, I would be taking job to job to job, going from 
one movie to the next. Um, mostly not filming in LA. So weirdly you live in LA to, to go shoot on location in other places. So when I was in town, we would go back to this bubble, this like insular bubble with beautiful blaringly loud music and no one else and nothing else. And then, you know, I'd, I'd go off to, to work. Uh, and so did he. Uh, well, eventually, yeah, he left to shoot Lone Ranger, I believe. Okay. Now, we've heard a little bit about Lone Ranger, and that that's about mid-2012, is that right, when he was shooting that? That sounds right, mid-2012, yeah. And were you shooting anything at that time? I was shooting... Um, Machete kills. I believe I was shooting Machete Kills in Austin. I had a small part in a Robert Rodriguez film that shot in Austin. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think Johnny was shooting and then having some time off, and there was just a lot of travel, a lot of movement. So, okay. and, and so what, if any, visiting did you do with Johnny while he was on his set for Lone Ranger, and where was he? Well, he was filming all over the Southwest, and at some point I came to visit him and uh, on one of his locations, and I would stay in the house because I couldn't really, you know, occasionally I would leave with his security guards, but I, I didn't really have anything to do but visit him for a few days. So I'd cook and um, kind of stay at home and paint or whatever and wait for him to come home and have dinner ready. And um, it, it was, we would have these little bubbles, but kind of scattered throughout the Southwest and, as he was filming. And at the time, um, Johnny had, you know, when I first arrived at one of these locations, it was the first time that Johnny told me that he had had a health issue, uh, something with his liver, and that he wasn't, um, it, that's why he was not drinking. Um, he was drinking a lot of tea, like a lot of tea. Okay. And so I, we've heard a little testimony about boots. What, if anything, did you do to help? Johnny with his boots. Well, I mean, I um, I suppose that I took off his boots uh, and it made an impression on him. And I would I was happy to you know anything I can do to to show love. Um, certainly, how I felt about him. But if he wanted to take off his own boots, he he certainly could. Did you buy Mr. Depp any knives during that time period? Objection leading. Sustained. What if any? Uh, what if anything did you do with respect to knives during the time period you were with him in the Lone Ranger? Objection. Leading. What if anything? Overruled. I uh, Johnny had a thing for turquoise, and uh, that eventually, you know, being in the Southwest, it happens really. It can happen really quickly. I also too really love turquoise, and he has a. Um, he loved knives. He loves a lot of things. When Johnny loves things, he does it a lot, and lots of it. Uh, so he had these daggers that he had given me that really, they were beautiful in design. Um, and uh, they're, you know, long, curved daggers. Uh, and he just talked a lot about knives, had a knife and gun collection, uh, and was quite proud of it. And at some point, I, I don't really remember exactly when it was, but I, at some point I picked up a, what I thought was a really beautiful turquoise-handled um, knife. And I uh, had it engraved with a saying um, that Johnny would say to me all the time, uh, which I, you know, thought was romantic, as funny as that is to say now. And what was the expression, the saying? Uh, until death, uh, um, hasta la muerte in Spanish. Now, by the time that you're visiting Mr. Depp in at, during his shooting of uh, Lone Ranger in the June through August 2012 time frame, uh, what, if any, relationship has he developed with your family? Oh, well, starting really early on, Johnny was so kind so generous to my family, but especially, especially my mom and dad, he just really, he met my dad and um, my dad's a big personality. Uh, he's, a, he's a rowdy guy. And uh, 
Johnny just all of a sudden, I had never noticed, you know, Johnny have a Southern, all of a sudden Johnny had the Southern accent and was really like buddy buddies with him. And they really seemed to get along very well. They're, you know, just like instantly he was giving my dad gifts. He gave him guns, he gave him knives. They had this, I mean, Johnny just really just showered my dad. And my dad's a, a working man, you know, um, salt of the earth guy. And he was just like, you know, floored. He's getting all these amazing gifts and being invited to come on to these locations. And, you know, Johnny's this big movie star. And my dad was just like, you know, I think my dad would have married him himself, not <laughs> if I hadn't. And he just instantly, he gave my mom jewelry, brought her out to come and see me while I was visiting Johnny uh, on on Lone Ranger in, in some part of the Southwest. I think it was Colorado. He gave her this beautiful turquoise necklace. And I mean, that, yeah, they were, they were definitely um, taken by him. And what, if any, uh, relationship had Mr. Depp forged with Whitney by this time, your sister? I believe the relationship came a little bit later as they got to know each other, but he did the same thing with my sister and just really found um, a bond with with them that, you know, was... It, it was, you know, he, he tried to do anything and everything he could for to make them feel like special and they did you know my mom my dad and my sister and what if any relationships did mr depp form with your friends well johnny's so generous and can be this really like overly generous almost you know like showering you with gifts and compliments and just i mean like, you know, and he has access and means to really, you know, we're not talking about giving you a card. We're like talking about just these like extravagant trips or these extravagant gestures. And it's, it's a lot. And he's, he did that with my close friends. I'm relied heavily on, on my, on my friends and had a pretty strong support network with them. And he really just showered, showered them with generosity and love and, light and invited them to come to these exotic places and flew people here and there. I mean, it's incredibly, incredibly generous. So going back to the filming of the Lone Ranger, what if anything did Mr. Depp do with respect to a horse? Objection leading. What if anything? Overruled. Uh, Johnny at one point insisted on buying me a horse. And I, of course, said that's ex extravagant. I, there's no way I could accept that. That's how, also, how will I take care of that horse? You know, it's just it's so extravagant. So I said, no, of course. Eventually, he got a hold of my dad and worked it out with my dad, like what kind of horse to buy, and then showed me a picture of this horse and said, it's yours. It's 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 coming here. I think it was being transported, and he said, you know, that he had my dad's help on it, picking out. And you know, I grew up on on my dad's horses. You know, I grew up riding with my dad. So, you know, I I went. I had I had um, resisted for I think about like a month and a half or something of him kind of bringing up the idea and me saying that's a crazy gift. No, thank you. No, that's incredibly generous, but I couldn't accept to. All of a sudden, I had a cult. So, um, so let's let's take you through 2012 and your relationship. Could you just describe for the jury a little bit about how that relationship evolved through 2012? It was always intense. It didn't become intense. It almost started that way. Um, I, when I was with him, you know, I, I felt that electricity in my body. I felt like butterflies that couldn't, you know, I couldn't see straight. 
practically. It was just, you know, I had, I was head over heels in love. And he felt like that to me. He, he felt like he was also in love. I didn't feel like he was faking it. I, I felt like we, what we had, it felt like to me at the time, there wasn't any love like that, you know? I mean, and then I, he would, he started to kind of do this thing again where he'd disappear and he'd come back. And I remember it, at first he would, when he first started drinking, I didn't really think much of it, but all of a sudden the behavior kind of started to go in line with the disappearing and he'd come back and he'd just be different. And I, I'd say something and he'd accuse me of saying something else or saying it in a different way or he would, um, it was mostly my clothing at the time and me working, that was the main thing. Like I found myself trying to not talk about auditions because it was, it would change the mood so dramatically. I, I tried to, you know, he would make these comments about, you know, pouring myself out, but do so in the context of me acting, you know, and he would talk about other actresses who do my role in this way where they were worthless whores, that they were, they were you know, uh, uh, fame hungry, you know, expletive, expletive, you know, just this, the point is it felt really dirty to be an actor. It, never mind that he was one. It was more, it was dirty that I wanted to do this job that I wanted to do and I was doing the job of an actress. It was everything I, every time I was walking out of the house, I, he would ask me, that's really what you're wearing, kid? Oh, I see. You know, I, I wore a dress to an event once and I felt, I felt beautiful in it. <laughs> like, stupid as that sounds, I, I felt pretty in this dress I picked out and I showed him because I, you know, it's a carpet, it's red carpet, so it's like, you know, pu publicized and I kind of thought it was weird. He didn't, wasn't saying anything about it. You know, I left him to go do this red carpet and I, was like, did you see the, the, you know, the event I went to, you know, basically I just, I, I, I felt pretty and I thought like, did you see that? You know, I wanted him to say something about that, I guess. And, um, and he said, well, this is after he stopped talking to me for some time, didn't tell me why when he came back into my life, he wouldn't explain why he was acting different. He just kind of acted mad at me and know what I had done wrong. And when I brought up the dress and the event, because it was an event to support a charity I was really involved with at the time. And I said, you, you know, did you see that thing? And he said, yeah, yeah, I think the whole world saw that kid. That's how they'll remember you. That's how the world will remember you. And I was like, oh, come on. I mean, it's like, but it, you know, I felt, I felt good in it. I felt good. And he said, yeah, kid, that's what you're putting out there in the world. No one will ever forget that. And that's all they'll see you as. That's what you, that's what you wanted. That's what you were going for. You know, my dress was slow cut. I get it. Slow cut. But I felt, um, you know, uh, I felt really embarrassed and horrible that I wore that. I felt like, how could I have made that choice? Of course, you know, he's right. You know, you start to believe it. I, I started to believe that, that that made a lot of sense, of course. Um, but it didn't stop with that. It was just, it, it was clothing in general. And when I walked out of the house, it was never, it wasn't just like, hey, you're not allowed to wear that. It was like, oh, really? That's what you're wearing. No wonder, no wonder you get cast in those roles. No wonder you, you, you that's what you are. That's what you're making it. And it just, it, you know, it continued. And then, then there would be a blow up. And at first it was just to throw something, smash some things. Um, it loves to smash up a, a place, an apartment, furniture. That's what it started with, um, glass. Threw glass at me and I remember it was summer. Um, and he just threw this glass across the kitchen and I, it didn't hit me, but I, I it, shattered behind me and I remember thinking that it like very easily could have hit me 
And that, calling me a whore, all, it didn't start with using the whore word, it was just comments um, until it would escalate. And then I started to notice the pattern of escalation where he'd throw glass or turn over a table. Then he would hit the wall and then he'd hit the wall really close to my head. You know, like when I'm standing there, you know, just hit the wall screaming at me. Um, but then he would um, disappear and get clean and sober and he'd come back and tell me that he, had, he was done drinking, he was over it, he was done, he cleaned himself up, he had done it before and he'd do it again. And then he would go back to this like wonderful, like almost like just unreal, like but real, you know, but un, unbelievably nice, sensitive, kind, warm, generous, interesting, funny man that I loved. And he would make me feel so loved. Like it would get, I would feel so distant from that thing that was so scary that I would not even recognize it too. And that was how, you know, our relationship kind of started to develop in that first year. Do you remember the first time that he physically hit you? Yes. Please tell the jury about it. <sighs> it was so, it's seemingly so stupid, so in, like insignificant. I will never forget it. It changed, it changed my life. I was sitting on the couch and we were talking. We were having a, like a normal conversation, you know, just there was no fighting, no argument, nothing. And um, he was drinking and um, I didn't realize at the time, but I think he was using cocaine because it was like there was a jar, a jar. Of cocaine out on the table. I, re I realize that sounds weird, but it's like a, an actual vintage jar of it. But I didn't see him use it at the time, so I, I didn't really factor that in. I just, you know, he's drinking and we're talking and it's there's music playing and he's smoking cigarettes and we're sitting next to each other on the couch. And I ask him about the tattoo he has on his arm. And to me, it just looked like um, black marks. It, like I didn't know. I didn't know what it said. It just looked like muddled, faded tattoo that was hard to read. And I said, "What does it? What does it say?" And he um, said, "It says why no." It says why no. And I, um, I didn't see that. I thought he was joking uh, because it didn't look like it said that at all. And I laughed. It was that simple. Um, I, I just laughed because I thought he was joking and slapped me across the face. And I laughed. I laughed because I, I didn't know what else to do. I thought, this must be a joke. This must be a joke. Because I'm, I didn't know what was going on. I just stared at him, kind of laughing still thinking that he was going to start laughing too to tell me it was a joke, but he didn't. He said, you think it's so funny. You think it's funny, bitch. You think you're a funny bitch. And he slapped me again. Like, it was clear it wasn't a joke anymore. And I stopped laughing, but I didn't know what else to do. You know, you... I, I didn't know what to do. You, you would think you, you would have a response, but I, as a woman, had never been hit like that. I'm an adult, and I'm sitting next to the man I love, and you slap, he slapped me for no reason, it seemed like, and I missed the point. It was that stupid. Second slap, I know he's not kidding, but I don't know what else to say or do, so I just stared at him. I didn't say anything. I didn't react. I didn't move or freak out or defend myself or anything or say, what are you doing? You're crazy. I just stared at him because I didn't know what else to do. And he slaps me one more time. Hard. I lose my balance. Um, 
at this point, we're sitting next to each other at the, on the edge of the couch, or I was on the edge of the couch. And I'm all of a sudden realizing that the worst thing has just happened to me that could possibly happen to you. I realized that I, I wish so much he had said he was joking because it didn't hurt. It didn't physically hurt me. I was just sitting there on this, on, on this carpet, looking at the dirty carpet, wondering how I wound up on this carpet and why I was never, why I never noticed that the carpet was so filthy before. And I just didn't know what else to do. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to react. I just sat there thinking, how much time do I have to I figure out what I need to do? Because God, did he just hit me? No, I didn't want to leave him. I didn't want this to be the reality. I didn't want to have the man I was in love with. I know you don't come back from that. You know, I'm not dumb. I, I know you can't hit a woman. I, you can't hit a man. You can't hit anyone. You can't just hit somebody because they... I knew there was no... I knew it was wrong, and I knew that I had to leave him. And that's what broke my heart because I didn't want to leave him. I thought if I got up out of that room, I'd leave the best thing that ever happened to me. And I wish I could sit here and say I stood up and I walked out of that house and I drew a line and I stood up for myself. I was just looking at the dirty carpet trying to will myself to get up, to walk out of the door because I knew I needed to and I really slowly I stood up and I remember looking at him in the eye and just looking at him frankly because I didn't know what else to do and before I know it he starts crying and you know like I, I had never seen an adult man cry um, I didn't even really see my dad cry at my grandma's funeral you know it just it's weird and he's crying, uh, tears, I mean, just falling out of his eyes. He gets down on his knees and he grabs my hands and he's touching my hands and he's saying to me, I will never do that again. I'm so sorry, baby. I, I put the fucker away. I thought I killed it and it's, it's done. I, 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 I thought I put the monster away and I've done it before. It's done. But on his knees and I... I, I, I didn't have words. I didn't know what to say. I just remember thinking that it was just, he was crying. He seemed so sorry, but I knew I couldn't just forgive him because I, right? That, that means it will happen again, no? You know, like I've seen the health class videos like everyone else. And I got up in my car. I walked to the car. I didn't say anything. I made a point that, to not say oh it's okay or anything like that I just didn't say anything I got up I went to the car I sat in my car and I felt like I sat there forever I didn't want to turn the key I just leaned my head up against the window and I remember just seeing my breath on the on the windshield you know on the the glass of the uh, of the window of the door just seeing my breath and trying to will myself, to have the strength to know what I should do in this moment because I was heartbroken. And I sat there for a long time and I eventually turned the key and drove home. What did you do after that? I don't know, I, I don't remember what I did when I got home. I don't remember, um, I went to my therapist. I told her. Objection hearsay. I, um, I'll sustain as, as to what she may have told her. I um, went home and I, um, a few days later, I uh, started getting, I actually don't know how many days later, but I started getting calls and texts from Johnny. Um, 
you know, apologizing profusely. I mean, just, you know, he was, he said, I'd rather cut my hand off than ever lay it on you or lay it upon you, you know, and he had that way of talking. It felt like poetry. And uh, he showed up to talk, like with the understanding that, you know, he understood I could never forgive him and it was done. So I felt kind of safe and saying, okay, let's have a talk or, you know, yeah, we'll talk. I, I, I think I, you know, I, I know I just wanted to see him and he comes over, brings me gifts. He brought me a couple of cases actually of that Vega Cecilia wine that we've heard about, um, which is a really nice expensive wine that I could never at that time dream of affording, you know? Um, and we talk and he tells me that he had put this thing away, that I could trust him, that it would never happen again. Of course, it would never happen again. That he had put this thing away. He had killed the fucker is what he said to me over and over again. I put that fucker away. I killed that monster. I'll kill it again. It's done. I'll never lay a hand on you again. And I wanted to believe him, so I chose to. Chose to stay in the relationship. Yeah, I did. I I believed it, but you know, I believe it wouldn't. I believed that there was a line he wouldn't cross again, and that was it. And so you stayed. Correct. You stayed in the relationship. Yes. Okay. So, just, is this a good time? You no, don't need to you break. Keep going. It's a little longer. It's, okay. Thank you. So, could you please describe for the jury um, the evolution of your relationship after that time with Johnny? Um, I don't. <clears throat> I don't know how long it was until. Things got bad again. Uh, he did start drinking again. Uh, I remember the it was it was almost you know he start drinking again, the disappearing thing, the coming back. He'd come back at ran, like in the middle of the night to my house, um, and he, it would be unclear to me, you know, drunk often really drunk and kind of accusing me, but not directly. It was, nothing was very direct. It was a lot of accusations, but they were veiled. Um, you know, what I was wearing, who I was with, why didn't I text him back? I didn't text him back right away. Um, when I, this is when I was at my place in Orange. Sometimes he would show up to catch me. I, like that was a pretext for coming over. And by the time, by the time we were done talking, would be, I would have thought I convinced him that I loved him, that I only loved him, there was no one else, and then that we were back in an upswing and would go back to good, loving, like sick, romantic love, like kind, sweet, velvety love. <laughs> and then it would be something I said, why did you say it that way? Um, you know, if I had to leave for an audition, I could guarantee that when I, not couldn't guarantee, but two of those in a row, and when I came back, he was angry at me, you know, and I wouldn't necessarily know why, and then he started accusing me of things, probably, like, at first it was indirect, and then it became really direct, then the punching uh, of the walls next to my head, was, which is a constant at the, at, at that time in 2012, when he was drinking, um, eventually that became a, uh, you know, him accusing me of cheating, I'd defend myself, I'd say, you know, that's crazy, you're wrong, I would never, the normal things. And uh, it would escalate to the point where he would push me or shove me down and then I'd get back up. And this happened several times, that's why it's not more specific, I suppose. It, when I'd get back up, I'd, I'd, I'd look him in the eye, I made a point of getting up 
and looking him in the eye. It's my way of defending myself at that time. And I'd look at him, and he'd ask me if I wanted to go again, and shove me back down. Eventually, he just hit me. Uh, remember, he hit me in the face when I denied having an affair with my ex-wife, my ex-partner at the time. Um, and he said he had proof. I denied it. And I was walking out of the bedroom, slapped me across the face. I turned to look at him. And I said, Johnny, you hit me. You just hit me. I'm going to ask you, Michelle, can you bring up 1783, please? What number again, please? I'm sorry. What number? Defendants 1783. 1783. Thank you. Do you recognize this picture? Yes, I do. And could you tell us what it is? Uh, it's a picture of my face with um, a note that Johnny left uh, for me by the coffee. Typically is where we'd leave notes like that. And does this accurately depict the scene portrayed? It was one of those scenes. I, um, I As embarrassing just, as it sounds now, I don't know which scene this came from. There was a lot. It escalated quickly, fast, and it was became... Amber, uh, let, let me ask it a different way. I'm thank just, you. Um, is this a picture of you? Is it an accurate picture of you? Yes. Your Honor, I'm going to move the admission of 1783. Your Honor, we have an objection. May we okay, approach? Sure, sure. Would you please describe for the jury uh, some of the cycles you had with Mr. Depp through 2012? So in 2012, the violence was pretty, you know, relative to what it became, pretty, you know, slapping, uh, backhanding. Slapping. Well, it went from, it went from this eggshell Kind of you're walking on eggshells nothing you're doing is kind of right but you don't know what you're doing wrong uh, and then I was doing something wrong clearly but they were it was unclear within the scope of an argument what I was defending myself against so it would shift from uh, a rumor he had heard that I was with um, my a friend or I had been photographed standing too close to a male person that was a person I'd have a, and if I had had something with, and I was lying to him about, and the, it would be egg, it would be eggshells, accusations, accusations, and then he would explode. Um, it started with throwing things, um, uh, destroying the property, and screaming at me. I remember the screaming at me was the worst because I kind of always felt like I had done. You know, I had to defend myself. I had to tell him I, so he didn't think these things were true. And sometimes, you know, I, he would shift accusations. While I'm trying to dispel one accusation, he'd start another one. And um, nothing I could do to calm him down, it seemed like. I'd walk away, and that would make it worse. Um, I remember he, in my apartment in Orange, it would he would grab me by the hair or he'd grab me by the arm, face pull me into him, 
scream at me that way. He'd smash things around me. Then he would smash things very close to me. And then he would just hit me. And it started with slapping um, and it got to be like repetitive slaps where he'd hold me um, in a position and slap me multiple times um, in a row. Uh, then it would be, you know, eventually I later would either push him off of me or I'd try to hit his hands away from me. I tried to, not in 2012 so much. At that time, I was mostly, um, my defense was, uh, I'd go some other place. Like, I don't, know how, I don't know how to describe that. It was, I'd focus on something else. I'd stand up, look at him, try to stand up to him that way. Later, I adopted other kind of strategies to deal with it. But at the time, in 2012, it was, he'd have this blowout. And then he would leave, disappear. And he would, I'd be committed to not talking to him. I'm done with this relationship. I can't take it anymore. I said that so many times. And then he'd come back, clean and sober, telling me he had a chip. He didn't have any chips, but he would say, I've, I've gone to meetings. I have a, I have a, a sober companion now. Um, I'm doing this program. I'm reading this. I'm doing this. And he was done with drugs and alcohol for good this time. And he'd come back in my life. And with the combination of him being sober and having gone through this horrible thing where I felt like my heart ripped out of my chest, you know, like a relationship ending is hard, I think, for anyone. But ending under that circumstance is really painful. And so when he'd come back, it would almost feel like a solve, a solution to that. And it would feel great. And we would be good again. And it would be he'd be extra nice and extra apologetic and extra loving and it would just, then we'd be back in, in, in the good bubble, the warm glow. And eventually it'd get bored and then I'd see him drinking again. Um, when I started to get upset, noticing the pattern um, of the violence going with the, the drinking and drugs, then, I, then he started sneaking it. So it became less clear and I'd have to look for clues as to what he was on, so I just knew how to react, you know? Uh, Johnny on speed is very different from Johnny on opiates. Uh, Johnny on opiates, very different from <sighs> Adderall and, 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 and cocaine Johnny, which is very different from Quaaludes Johnny. But I, I had to get good at paying attention to the different versions of him. Uh, 2012, I was in a... Um, I was in the beginning stages of this, just learning these patterns. I was just learning that drinking kind of correlated with the violence. And did you confide in anyone about these issues you were having? I think she Jackson can say. She, I think she can say if she told anybody. As long as she didn't say what she said. Right. Right. So did you con did you tell anyone? Yes, I did. Who did you tell? I told my therapist. I told. I eventually told my mom. And let's uh, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Defendant's Exhibit 150. One fifty. One five zero. Your Honor, I'm going to object on hearsay.
why did you decide to confide in your mother about the issues you were having with Mr. Depp? I, th I think I, I felt safe talking to my mom because I knew that she understood these dynamics and she wouldn't judge me for staying with him, for loving him, even though um, this was happening and was happening to me. I knew she would understand. And when approximately did you start confiding in your mom about your issues with Mr. Depp and physical abuse? Objection, hearsay, compound. I sustain the compound. When did you start confiding in your mother about the abuse you were, be, were, were suffering at the hands of Mr. Depp? I, well, I, I was confiding in her from the very beginning about the abuse the psychological abuse, the kind of control, the disappearing, the not knowing where he was, the then he'd come back and sometimes in the middle of the night, the constant accusations, like that sort of thing. I, I talked to her about probably from the very beginning. Um, the fact that I was secret, I had to hide. Um, I couldn't tell any of my friends that I was with him for a long time because he told me everyone would blame me for the split with him and his partner. So I had to kind of sneak around and kind of get brought to his house, typically in, in a secretive way, and then he'd come to mine in a secretive way, and it was just all very, you know, so very isolating. And uh, I, I confided with her at the very beginning on that sort of thing, and then later opened up to her about some of the violence. I did it gently. You know, um, first I just wanted to have someone to talk to about how scary it was, you know. he'd. Is the rage and the the uncontrolled violence, the rage that this man had, and why it Objection, was pointed at me? Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. May we approach? Please? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and take our 15-minute afternoon break, so please do not talk about the case or do any outside research. Okay, we'll see you soon. And Ms. Hurd, just a reminder that now that you're on the stand, you cannot discuss your testimony with anybody to include your attorneys, okay? okay. All right, so we'll be back. Let's make it 345, okay? 345. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, we're ready for the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, great. Thank you. Please be seated. Your next question. Thank you, Your Honor. Amber, I'm going to take you up to March of 2013. Um, can you describe your relationship with Mr. Depp during that month? And we'll start there. I remember um, that was after a period of a really, some, it was after a period of some peace and then um, he, in sobriety, Johnny was sober, um, drinking Bex. And my uh, dad, uh, who was struggling with alcohol um, and drug addiction at the time, had fallen off the wagon. And, and I remember he said, why don't we send a, I want to send a picture to, you, to your dad of support, because uh, my sister was upset with my dad. Um, and so, uh, he poured a shot and, um, and, and, and kind of said, let's take a picture. Uh, I don't, I don't drink spirits, but I, I, I know that, you know, I kind of held up in that picture. It's kind of eerie because I just think it's bizarre. He had broken this long period of sobriety that I thought was going to be the, the end of him drinking forever. I sounds foolish now, but I, you know, held up this kind of glass with him and we sent the picture to my dad because, it, you know, I didn't know what else to do. And I remember thinking it was weird that he was drinking. And, um, and then the month got really crazy from that point on. It was, um, a bit of, um, a revolving door of accusations. Uh, he was accusing me of having affairs with, um, well, frankly, just one person I had an, I was an acquaint, I had an acquaintance with somebody and he was accusing me of, of, um, of, of being with them. And then it was accusing me of being with my friend, the one I had seen in Spain. Uh, I, I'm, you know, in these kind of arguments, nothing I do is working. I've, uh, walking out of the room is me leaving him, walking away from me, you know, hey, where are you going? I'm talking to you. That it, some, it, it went from that to, um, pulling me in by, by my arm, um, still shouting at the, about the accusations. Um, I'm s trying to diffu diffuse the situation by trying to tell him I'm not sleeping with this person and I'm not sleeping with that person. And it was kind of, as soon as it seemed as though I had convinced him of one, there was somebody else he was sure I was sleeping with. Um, and he, he, it was a revolving door at that time, um, a painting I had hanging on the wall done by my ex, who's an artist. That was one day he, he was convinced that that was proof I was sleeping with her or having an affair with her. I didn't really love him. And all the while I'm madly in love with him and trying to convince him. So March started with this picture of him doing a shot and he's kind of saying, let's send it to your dad to show support. And what I remember of March is just uh, like an almost, ne it's almost like it was a never ending fight. It was just, there were breaks in it. What kept me in it is beca because I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop, you know, the sobriety shoe, if you will. I kept waiting for him to get to the point where it's not supportable or 
anymore and he's done with it and he's ready to get clean and sober again because there commences a period of like pure joy. And it was one fight after the other, March. So, so let me start with the painting incident. Please tell the jury what happened on that particular incident with the painting. Uh, as I mentioned, the painting which had been hanging there for uh, months, uh, one day he, he kind of stayed up doing cocaine, just drinking, doing cocaine music, which is un not in and of itself that weird in my relationship with Johnny at this point, you know, like he stays up and keeps weird hours and you know, smokes and stuff. But the, the, he was drinking um, brown liquor and doing a lot of cocaine. And it was like, it became clear to me in that argument, if you will, that it was, he wasn't making sense. He had effectively just taken, it seemed like, a turn and had decided that the painting was the big, the, an offense that he could not forgive me for. It meant I was having an affair with my ex-partner whom I had already split, with whom I had already split, and it made no sense to me. So I'm, I'm trying to kind of quell the accusations by saying, you know, it's been there, and what are you talking about? And it's like, that doesn't mean anything. And, you know, he was demanding I take it down. He eventually takes it down and tries to burn it, but it was unsuccessful, luckily, because he was not, he, he didn't, he wasn't, <laughs> With a, uh, one of those normal, what do you call it, Bic lighters, he wasn't very successful at doing it while drinking um, to the extent he was. But I remember it was this kind of ridiculous fight. Like, didn't feel like it needed to be an argument, but it seemed like nothing I could do, nothing I could say. I uh, tried leaving. I um, left the room. I left the house. I eventually came back. It was, it was like a whole night of an evening, a night, and then a morning of this. So this morning in particular, I think it was the like 22nd of, of March. There were several incidents in March though. Um, but in this particular one, he had something to go to. He was filming with Keith Richards and um, uh, Tom Waits. Well, let, let me, before you go into that part, let's, let's pull up uh, Defendant's Exhibit 161 which is already admitted into evidence, I believe, Your Honor. Yes, 161 with redactions. Is Thank you. Evidence. And I'm going to show you Defendant's Exhibit 161. And the date on this is 3-12-2013, and it's a text exchange between you and Mr. Depp. Do you see that? I do. Okay. Um, and the first one is from you to Mr. Depp. Just thought you should know there exists a book. Is that to you? Is it to Mr. Depp from you, or it's vice versa? Isn't um, it? It's Johnny texting me. Just thought you should know there exists a book titled Disco Bloodbath. And then you say, we need that book. And you say, is this about last Friday night by any chance? And he says, how can you make me smile about such a hideous moment? Uh, and I'm not going to repeat the rest of it. Um, could you tell the jury what happened on that Friday night? Um, there were, like I said, there was a few different incidents in March. Um, I believe this one happened in the Eastern Columbia building, which are one of Johnny's penthouses. They're in downtown, so a different part of Los Angeles. And we'd sometimes go there. Uh, I remember he was accusing me again of um, sleeping with this artist, this musician who I'd never slept with. Um, I was denying it. I, I barely knew the person. Uh, and then he was accusing me of, of, of sleeping with my friend in, in Spain. Um, and I, I remember nothing I could do. He like called this person on the phone and screamed at screamed at him. Um, he didn't speak English, so he was really confused as to what he was being yelled at by Johnny. Um, but I remember those were the accusations. That, that was the fight, that, it, but it was one to the next. 
accusation. And I remember I was kind of doing that juggling act. I was in his, one of these fights, I believe it's this one, in his downtown ECB, we call it, um, loft. And we're in the kitchen living room area and he backhands me. And, you know, it was, um, you know, he wears a lot of rings. Uh, I remember kind of just feeling like the, my lip went into my teeth and uh, it got a little blood on the wall. It, just that simple, a little bit of blood on the wall. As hard as it is, as hard as it is to explain this, I, I was so caught up in the relationship and also very occupied in defending what I only as, could assume he believed, these accusations, um, that, you know, I didn't, I didn't internalize, like, I didn't make that big of a deal of it. I'm, you know, I kind of pride myself on being tough and, you know, I don't make a big deal out of, you know, smaller injuries. And I know that sounds horrible because it, and hard maybe to understand, but um, I mean, my best way to cope with it is I kind of, you know, minimize it, make 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 sure no one, <clears throat> make sure he knows that I'm I'm tough and can't knock me down, and I make a joke of it. Clearly, make light. I'm going to, uh, Michelle, if you can take this one down and um, bring up 170A. Did there come a time in March, Amber, where you sent a picture to your mom? Uh, yes, this is um, sometime in March uh, 2013. I just... I. I sent it to her because I had been texting about some of the craziness and I... Objection, hearsay. I'll sustain as to what she may have texted. All right, next question. Uh, it, it, without saying what you said in the text, explain why you were sending it to your mom. I was reaching out. Uh, I was very lonely in what I was living in and I wanted help. I wanted advice, help. And some, I just wanted to talk to somebody Okay. and figure out how I can make this stop. And, and is this a picture that you took of yourself in March of 2013? I did. Your Honor, I'm going to move the admission of Defendant's Exhibit 170A. Any objection? No objection. All right, 170A in evidence. You can publish the picture. Thank you, Your Honor. And how did you sustain that bruise, Amber? Um, I was, I had thrown a, um, I, well, I, Johnny slapped me, I walked away from him, and that made it worse. We got into, a, like, a, a shouting match, um, and he kind of did this thing with his body where I could tell he was going to hit me again. Um, I picked up, um, like, a... I remember it kind of like a um, like a little pot, not a pot but um, like a vase, and uh, I I remember um, I got away from him enough as he reels back I threw it in his direction and got, actually managed to get away before he got before he got me. Um, he grabbed me by the arm um, and he kind of just held me on the floor, screaming at me. Um, I don't know how many times he hit me in the face, but uh, I, re I remember being on the floor of my apartment, and I'm just, I remember thinking, how could this happen to me again? Can you bring up 170?
Michelle, and and if we can, and just for to, to start, it's at three twenty three two thousand thirteen, and if we can scroll scroll up. This is a text message exchange with your mom, correct? Yes, it is. Okay, let's go and then scroll down and then. Your Honor, I'm going to object to hearsay. Right, let's wait until we get to the spot. All right, and is this the picture that you sent to your mom on 323 2013? Yes, it is. Your Honor, I'm going to move the admission of 170 just that partake that picture that's on the text. With, with, Along no, with, with no words? Uh, well, it says things? from two weeks ago yeah. on it. Your Honor. Uh, I'll sustain the objection. If we redact the from two weeks ago, can we admit it then? And then just have the showing that it, she sent it to her mom. May we approach your Honor? Okay. All right, 170 will be in evidence with redactions. And may we publish to the jury, please? Right. And that's the picture you sent to your mom? Yes, it is. On March 23rd, 2013. Yes, it was from a previous fight. Okay. The bruise. All right. Now, did you have any other altercations in March 2013 with Mr. Depp? Yes. Um, we, had, um, we had a couple of these fights in Orange that were around this time, one of which I started to tell you about the painting. You know, and I know I've interrupted you now twice on that, but I realize the jury doesn't. Can you tell them what you mean by orange at orange? Uh, sorry, orange was my apartment that I kept in Los Angeles at the time. And it was an apartment. What type of an apartment? I rented the top of a duplex. So it was a house um, with the landlord living on the bottom floor. I rented the top floor. Okay. Thank you. Now, please continue with the painting. I'm sorry. Um, I, nothing I could, it seemed like nothing I could say to Johnny would convince him. He wanted me to remove the painting. Um, and he wanted me to admit to this affair that I wasn't having. And I didn't want to admit to it because it's not true. So I held out, and he just started, I mean, he just drank more and did more cocaine. And I woke up the next morning, I think it was on the 22nd or the 23rd, I woke up in the morning and he was, the breakfast table was like cocaine and booze. And I realized that there, that I wasn't gonna be able to talk my, like I wasn't gonna be able to talk our, 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 our situation down. I wasn't going to be able to talk him out of it. And he was just so convinced that I was fighting with him or, or, or at the reason that he wouldn't leave the house. And he had something to go film that was important. And there were important people waiting for him. And I remember people were reaching out, his assistants, his manager, sister, you know, everyone was wondering where he was. And I kind of, I kept feeling embarrassed and unable to move this person 
out of my house. I couldn't calm him down. I couldn't change. He was just so intent on me admitting the details of this affair that I, I wasn't having. And me pointing out that the cocaine wasn't making his situation any better made me the bad cop. Then I'm the nag. Um, so eventually I called my sister. Uh, he had a kind of a buddy-buddy relationship with her at the time. And at the time, she occasionally did cocaine. I didn't, but she did. So I was like, hey, come take over. You know, maybe you can buddy-buddy him and talk him into leaving the house, just getting out of the house. And she did. Um, I remember his assistants trying to get him out. Like we, Eventually, in the evening, I think early evening, he finally um, agrees to leave. But I can't tell our relationship status. I can't tell if he still is convinced of these things or if he's just going to sleep it off. And it's going to go back to normal, sobriety, sorry kind of phase. And uh, he... Well, was still upset, but uh, like seemingly calming down. So I, I agreed to go with him. He wanted me to go to the to the the shoot. Um, I had plans, so I kind of reluctantly agreed, but didn't want to set anything off. I didn't want to engage anymore. I didn't want to do anything that could be perceived as antagon antagonizing him or engaging more. So I went with him. We grab the dogs, we get in the car, we're on the way there, we're headed up Sweetser's the street. It's a major street that um, leads up to Johnny's houses. Um, he effectively owns the end of the street. It's like a cul-de-sac. Um, so we're nowhere near his home, but we are driving up this street and uh, he has the window down, he's smoking. Um, it wasn't all the way down but, you know, he's constantly smoking, and at some point he starts howling out of the window and then grabs two small dogs. Well, one was Johnny's dog and one was my dog, but he grabs, if I, if I remember correctly, Boo, the, the, his, his dog, um, slightly chunkier um, teacup Yorkie, and he grabs this teacup Yorkie and holds... Boo out of the window of the moving car. And he's howling like, like an animal while holding the dog out of the window. And everyone in the car, I'll never forget it, everyone just froze. No one did anything. And I, I too was like torn as to what I should do because I didn't want to do anything to cause him to react, drop the dog. You know, it was just this eerie moment where he's howling and holding this animal outside of the, the car window. And more than that weird memory is the, that I have, a, more than that weird memory, I have a memory of everyone just kind of not really reacting to him. Like no one really kind of did anything. They... I eventually kind of pulled his arms gently back into the to the vehicle and kind of got the dog back on the seat and we continued driving but no one reacted they just kind of avoided dealing with it we get to the place the house where he was filming this thing that he was late for I suppose for the day and we walk in Meanwhile, I've been bombarded by text messages and, and calls and conversations with everyone seemingly so stressed about... Objection, hearsay. All right. Just, just don't tell us what somebody else said, just what you observed. I understood everyone was stressed. They seemed stressed to me about the tardiness. Where is he? Let's get him there, you know, so we get him there. And no one reacts when we get in. I mean, we walk into this house where everyone was waiting for him and everyone smiles and says you know hey boss objection hearsay okay so, sorry okay. let's uh, can michelle can we pull up uh, 167a uh, i think we did is b b the one you're saying 167b is already in right 
Oh, it's egg. Okay, then go ahead and pull up egg. Does your honor show that one to be in 167A? D defendants, it's, I'm it's, sorry. Well, yeah, it, this might be your 167A, but it's in evidence as a plaintiff's number, and I'm not sure which plaintiff's number it is. I don't need it in twice, so. I, I would agree. Do we? Your Honor, I don't think it's this version of the photograph okay, that's so been admitted. So, so it's, it's a, a it's different a, version. It's same a different photograph, but a little different. Is that what we're? It's not the same photograph. Okay, not the All same. Right, photograph. Well then, then, then we'll go with it. Then what's your, what, okay. what number is it? Do, do you recognize this photo? Yes, I do. Please tell the jury what it is. It's uh, a picture I took of my breakfast table uh, that morning. Your Honor, I'm going to move the admission of Defendant's Exhibit 167A. 167A, any objection? Your Honor, may we approach? Sure. Seven A is in evidence. You can publish. So we may we publish that. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, and Amber, you said that you took this that morning. Is that yes. correct? Could you tell the jury what the box is that has the property with the skull bones? Property of JD. Um, that's Johnny's. Um, drug box. I've seen it used for pills, but at the time it was um, bags of Coke, like okay. dime ba bags of Coke. Okay. And what are these white lines on the table to the left of that box? That is cocaine. Okay. Um, and do you know what is in these two glasses that have kind of a gold colored, colored liquor? Uh, yes. They're different, actually. It's confusing. They're different. Um, Different liquids. Uh, the one in the back in the larger glass is, um, I, I believe, at the time I um, was doing these tabs, or Barocca, that's what they're called, the little tablets. And um, anyway, uh, I remember at the time that that's what I was putting in my water because I had just come back from France where they sell them. And then the brown liquid in the shot glass is um, Johnny's liquor. I don't know what it's called, but it, we kept it in the freezer. At the time, it was bef, bef, you know, at that time, March 2013, I hadn't, you know, um, I still didn't have the, you know, hard line, I won't even keep that, you know, in my freezer sort of attitude or posture with him. I wasn't that bold at the time, you know, I didn't like it, but I didn't have that strength. I kind of, at that time, I think was doing things like trying to pour it out when I could. So um, what is the bag, the brown bag on the left side? What is that? Uh, that's um, a dop kit. It's um, like, you know, his prescriptions and um, cigarette, tobacco, weed, things that, like that. Okay, and then ab above it there appears to be a, a CD of some sort, a DVD something. Do you recognize that? Yes, it's um, the single, I, I, I believe is what it's called, the single he was making at the time. I think that's the song that they were filming a video for, if I'm correct. Okay. All right. Now, did you end up sending a copy of this picture to Rocky Pennington that day? I did. I sent it to my best friend at the time, and, you know, it was like, Look at my morning. Objection. Like, hearsay. Okay, you can't say what you said, but you sent it to your friend, correct? Mm -hmm. Let's go to, to 167, friend. please. And is that the email in which you sent this picture to Rocky Pennington on 322? Yes. 2013? Your Honor, I'd like to move the admission of the picture with the redaction of the message on it, 
uh, with the top with identifier redactions and we take out the rest of it. Uh, all right, any objection? No objection. All right, so we those redactions. 167, any evidence with redactions? All right, and may we publish, please? All right, and is this the text message, the email that you sent to Rocky with this picture? Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to take you to Let's go to Hicksville. Let's tell the jury about Hicksville, May 2013. Can you tell the jury what transpired at Hicksville? Uh, it is a, it's a, like a fancy um, trailer park, like a little hotel in the middle of nowhere, um, set up with these little trailers and uh, we had made a, a, a plan to go there with friends, and um, we were going to do, you know, like laffy, as we said, laffy drugs, like mushrooms, eat mushrooms, sit by a campfire. Um, there's really not a whole lot else to do out there. It's like a getaway. Um, we had made this plan, uh, and it was going fine. It was like a you know, kind of like a party out in the desert um, with a few friends and campfire and music. And um, I, I don't know who brought, somebody brought MDMA, um, was being passed around and somebody who, who took it um, kind of was starting to feel the effects of it, I guess is the best way to describe. She kind of reacted in this way where when the MDMA hit her, she kind of you know, we were sitting around a campfire, all of us, and she kind of just leaned into me and put her, you know, head on my shoulder and kind of grabbed my arm. I took it, you know, to be the effects of the drug. Um, and uh, I think I had eaten a, a mushroom cap, um, but was not feeling anything at the time. Um, I don't remember feeling anything. Um, because the night just kind of changed pretty dramatically um, before I really felt anything of the effects of that. But that was the environment we were in. And, um, and as soon as she kind of did this thing where she leaned into me, um, Johnny um, gets really activated he gets really upset and he starts well at first it, it, she thought he was kidding too I, she thought he was kind of making a joke I think we all did everyone kind of responded at first you know that, that it, like it was a joke but he he was like um hey man what are you doing you know what do, what do you what do you think you're doing and she kind of giggled and kind of leaned into me more and I knew in my body just instantly that it wasn't a joke um but she didn't so she's kind of still attached to my arm when he says it again to her louder. He says, hey man, you think you're touching my fucking girl? You think you're touching my fucking girl? That's my fucking girl. And he gets louder and louder. And she kind of did this thing half understanding what was going on. I think she kind of started to cry at this point, but she kind of threw up her hands and Johnny grabbed her, her wrist and kind of twisted it. And pulled her into him and said, do you know how many pounds of pressure it takes to break a human wrist? Huh? And he kind of held her and she just, she just looked frozen. And uh, she's crying and she was just denying, understanding what was going on. I stepped in. I kind of take Johnny's arm around, kind of, take Johnny's hand and kind of we start 
communicating. I don't remember if he immediately was accusing me or if it was sometime after. I wish I remembered, but we we agreed that we'd go and talk about it in the trailer. Uh, so we walked to the trailer, um, and when we're in the trailer, Johnny, by the time we get into the trailer, Johnny tells me that I um, had been instigating the, uh, uh, like, you know, in asking for this, and that I had invited it, and that I, I hadn't been honest with him about my relationship with this woman, and not to I didn't really know her that well. I mean, I actually don't know her at all, but I had met her. And I remember in the trailer, um, he's accusing me of, of lying about it and that I, you know, that I, that I had something with her. I'm trying to diffuse that. I'm trying to calm him down. And um, he just turned all that, um, it seemed like he turned all that rage onto the trailer itself. And he just started smashing things. Um, he picked up something on the table and threw it right into the glass cabinet. Um, he hit with his hand um, a, a, a wall sconce. Um, he cleared the tabletop on the little fold-down, um, like, kitchen dining room area in this trailer. I mean, it's a trailer. So there's only so much you can do. And he's screaming at me. Just screaming at me. Um, and I... I, I uh, eventually go back into the back the bedroom area uh, he comes into the bedroom area we had what I can only describe as um, a uh, uh, it sounded like nonsense from him it wasn't making sense and I realized that he's just probably really high um, because it wasn't making sense anymore. It wasn't like a direct accusation. I wasn't, he wasn't hearing me when I was saying, I, 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 I wasn't involved, wasn't cheating on him. I wasn't secretly trying to engage this woman in some sort of sexual affair. Um, and, and then it became clear to me, he was like looking for something. He, um, cleared things off the bed. I went into the bathroom and as I come out, um, he's at, he asked me where it is and how long I've been hiding it. And I, was, I was like, what are you talking about? And he says, you know what I'm fucking talking about. You know what I'm fucking talking about. Be honest with me. Where are you hiding it? And he kind of like makes to look into the bathroom. Um, and I gestured to the bathroom, which is to my right. I kind of like gestured to him and I said, I'm like, what? Well, what am I, where am I gonna, what am I hiding and where am I gonna hide it? And, and we're standing in this little hallway area outside of the bathroom and he starts, you know, pat, pat, what it feels like patting me down or saying he's patting me down, I can't recall, but he ripped my dress, the uh, strap top part of my dress. I had just dyed this thing um, myself, pink, and I, it's just one of those things I, <laughs> It's like, you know, that's my, I just finished that dress. And um, he's like grabbing my, my, my breasts. He's touching my thighs. Um, he rips my underwear off. Um, and then he, he, he proceeds to do a cavity search. He was looking. He said he was looking for his drugs, his cocaine, his coke. I was wondering how I, somebody who didn't do cocaine, and was against it, that was in and of itself causing problems in our relationship. How could I hide? Why would I hide his drugs from? Like, I, like he was insinuating that I was doing it or something. It made no sense. And he was telling me we're doing we're gonna we're gonna conduct a cavity search shall we like just shoved his fingers inside me now I, I just, just
just stood there staring at the stupid light. I didn't know what to, you know, I didn't know what to do. I just stood it just stood there while he did that. He twisted his fingers around. I, I don't I didn't say like stop or anything. I just So the next morning, um, what tr what transpired? I remember thinking that Johnny would change his mind, um, and it would be. Um, yeah, I thought it would end differently. I, I kind of froze. I don't know how we went to bed that night. I don't know how I went to bed. I don't know how I slept. I don't know how we woke up. I don't remember having a conversation with him the next day. I don't remember talking to him about it or confronting him about it. I, I remember wanting it to be okay. I remember just wanting whatever fucking weird trip, excuse me, whatever trip that was to end you know just to be over and for it to just go back to normal um and I remember my friends were out by the pool like the, the there was a pool in the center of the trailer park and I remember putting on my you know just putting on my face and going back into this like crap you know and, the, and I remember seeing my friends by the pool thinking they were just having a great time and no one knew what was, you know, I felt so lonely. Like no one knows what's, everyone was just having a good time, you know, like normal stuff. So I just smiled and made a joke about how trash the trailer got and we had to get the manager uh, who started off furious that Johnny had wrecked the thing. And then he had this like black mesh tank top, not tank top, but it was like a meshy kind of shirt on. And I remember he came into the trailer and looked around and was like, whoa, what happened here? Whoa. And Johnny had an exchange with him. And I remember wa watching this man be so charmed. It was just a kind of a surreal experience. And, you know, it just went away. You know, that just got fixed. We walked out of the trailer at some point. My dog stepped on a bee. We went to the vet and went on with our, you know, vacation. We actually went to another location after that and then eventually went home and went about our life. I'm going to ask you to take a look. Michelle, can you bring up Defendant's Appeal at 176? Did there come a time that you wrote an email? Objection, leading, and hearsay, Your Honor. May we approach? All right. In June 2013, how were you feeling about your relationship with Mr. Depp? 
May we have the exhibit taken away okay, from? Sure. Thank you. I um, by June I was so torn. I was so in love with this person because when it was good, it was so good. You've never felt love like that. At least that's how it felt. <laughs> so much. I felt like he recognized me and I recognized him and there was just something there that that was the love of my life. And he was. He was, but he was also this other thing. He was also this other thing. And that other thing was awful, awful thing that would come out and take over. And it was, you couldn't see the Johnny I loved underneath it. It was this other thing. And no one told him, no one was honest with him. No one, you know, he'd pass out in his own vomit. He'd lose control of his body, his, you know, he'd lose control and everyone would clean up after him. I cleaned up after him. I mean, this man lost control of his bowels and I cleaned up after him. His, his, his security cleaned up after him, changed his pants in front of me. He would pass out in his own sick. You know, and then he'd walk around saying he didn't have a problem until he did, until he couldn't support it anymore and he'd get clean and he'd get sober and then he was this thing again, this thing that made me feel so loved, that made me feel like, like my, like my soulmate is, cheesy as that sounds, I just felt like he knew me and I recognized something in him, either some part of my makeup and my background or something that I just got it and I loved him and understood him. It, it just got so scary, the other part of him. And in June, I wanted, I wanted to leave him. I wanted to... I didn't want to leave him. I wanted to want to leave him. I wanted him to get better. And he expressed to me so many times when he was in that period of getting clean and sober, he would tell me, you saved my life. Baby girl, you saved my life. Everyone else was saying that to me and I believed it. You know, if everyone else was saying it, he was saying it, I thought just like his other friends who had gotten clean and sober and stayed that way, his older friends, these rock stars that he hung out with that had like gotten clean and sober and they had 20, 30 years, something, you know, I thought, and Johnny told me he w would be that person, that he was going to be that person, and I believed it. I had so much, I looked at that man twice my age, you know, I was 25 looking at this man twice my age and I saw hope and like promise. I had so much hope, you know, the whole thing, kids and growing old together, sort of hope if it was just for this one thing that he could do, which would save his life, which would be to get clean and sober. And I believed it. And I wrote this letter to myself, uh, among many letters to myself. Objection, because I say. All she did was refer to that she wrote it. She isn't saying what she said. I will rule for that. Thank point. you. Okay. I wrote that letter sure. because I thought it would be read to him. I could read it to him. I could say it to him in intervention, you know, in help. And he would, he would later thank me for... As he did, as he used to thank me all the time for saving his life. Just, I. Did there come a time later in June that you finally met Johnny's kids? <sighs> yeah. I'm sorry. 
Um, yeah, I, um, I finally met them in the summer of 2013. I had been with Johnny for over a year, maybe like a year and a half at this point, is my best guess. And I was dying to meet them, you know, dying to get to know these kids. I felt like I knew them already. Uh, I had his daughters, uh, and actually, and Jack's, it, both, both of his kids' art on my fridge, and I had never even met them. You know, Johnny had brought them over one day and kindly given them to me, and I had them up on my fridge because I felt like I knew them, just how much he talked about them. And I finally got to meet them um, at the Lone Ranger premiere at Disneyland. Uh, yeah, summer 2013. So then I'm going to jump to, and, and it's not much of a jump, to June 26, 2013. Um, there was a plane ride to Russia with Johnny. Do you recall that? Yes. Well, tell the jury about that particular event. Uh, well, that was the first and last time I ever um, <laughs> decided it would be a a decent idea to do drugs with Johnny. Um, I did MDMA with, or did MDMA with him on the plane, which was as stupid as it may sound. Um, I just had never, I was very against, obviously the cocaine had been a, a problem. I was very much against him using cocaine. I was against the drinking, supportive of the sobriety, I, you know, but I'm 26, maybe, uh, ish, and I, w I wanted, you know, I had never heard of anyone making MDMA uh, like what I had, I had done MDMA before, you know, I thought it's a lovey drug, it's a, you know, it's like a kind of, I never knew anyone to uh, get violent on it, and, um, you know, I thought, well, this is a relatively contained environment. Maybe this will be different. Maybe I can be a good cop and be part of the, you know, like I don't have to be the lesbian counselor all the time, as you would say. You know, I can maybe be the fun girlfriend. And I learned the hard way that that was not happening. <laughs> um, so what happened? Well, we took um, we took MDMA. I took a, a capsule. Um, it's like a powder in a capsule. I took a capsule, and Johnny took uh, several. I didn't count, but um, you know it's very different when you see someone take one versus a handful of something. But nothing seemed to set any alarm bells off, and it, things were going fine until. Um, until the flight attendant got involved. The flight attendant came by, was engaging with us. Uh, I, I, I don't think that they're really, it felt like it was before the effects of the drug um, took over, it was, so it was relatively quick, soon after we first took our dose, if you can say, and the flight attendant, um, Johnny offered her some, she of course said no, and then after some back and forth between them, Johnny convinced her that it would be fine, so she acquiesced and took uh, MDMA with us. It's just, and within you know a few minutes go by, and she, the the same thing happened um, that happened on the mushrooms uh, Hicksville uh, with the woman Kelly Sue, who I've told you about. Uh, flight attendant got friendly with me, but just friendly, just like MDMA friendly, you know was kind of, I'm a woman, he's a man, so she was naturally, I think, more comfortable with me physically. She kind of leaned into me and kind of sat on the arm of the chair I was sitting in. I mean, after all, she she's on drugs, and um, Johnny uh, grabs, grabs her hand and tells her not to touch me, and she kind of reacts um, in a way, uh, like, you know, like she's defending herself and was trying to clar clarify and um, he grabbed her by the wrist and slammed it down on the table and told her he could break her wrist. And I remember thinking, I've heard this before. 
and that was a pattern that would repeat itself a few times. These things would happen in these kind of cycles where there would be a certain element that would get filtered for a while, whether it's an accusation or a gesture, and that would be the thing that he looped on. I called it looped, loops. And he grabs her wrist and he tells her he could break her wrist. She cries instantly, denies it, is so apologetic. Go, eventually, he lets go. She goes to the front of the plane where the flight attendant you know, normally hangs out and the doors close. And I don't see her much of that whole flight. <clears throat> uh, we land in Russia and I don't really remember you know, any, there was, I don't recall any violence on the plane um, between Johnny and I, but I remember feeling this tension because I was wondering when uh, it was going to aim at me because he had this particular thing about, well, at the time I understood he had a particular thing, a sensitivity about me and women because I had had a female partner. So I, I was feeling nervous anxious and um, I remember we had a very quiet ride at least I didn't say anything um, to the ride to the hotel and almost as soon as we get into the hotel room um, Johnny's accusing me of effectively having um, en engaged that uh, ca caused that um, I of course deny it uh, point out what I thought was obvious that, you know, like we, we'd given her drugs, you know, it's, wasn't an affair, wasn't, you know, and I'm trying to argue and defend myself at the same time, and um, at one point, Johnny just shoves me, like, I mean, just shoves, shoves me hard, and I fall back onto this glass table. Um, I catch myself on the table. Um, I don't know how, some furniture got knocked around. There was a, you know, I, I, I'm trying to stand up for myself. I'm trying to stand up, literally. I'm not, you know, at this point, I don't even try to hit back or try to run. I'm in this hotel room trying to do my best to fight mostly the verbal accusations, but also I try to stay on my feet, you know. Um, at some point, uh, Johnny whacks me in the face. And I don't even, I don't remember feeling pain or like awareness of my nose or anything. I just, I don't remember thinking that. I remember kind of crying and feeling, I went into the bathroom and I, I wanted him to have a, like, I, I, I just remember wanting him to realize what had happened. I wanted him to kind of snap out of it. I wanted him to care. I wanted him to realize what was going on because a big part of this, I felt like he wasn't aware. There was a sense that he didn't know what was going on. You know, again, I don't know how much of the drugs or alcohol is a part of this, but I remember crying. I came out at some point because I don't hear him in that room. I remember we had been arguing in the main room, but I went out to the hallway, which is where I presume he walked out, and his bodyguard, Jerry Judge, was in the hall. And I don't recall seeing Johnny in the hallway, but I remember seeing Jerry Judge, who... Um, gesture to Objection, my nose. hearsay. She's just saying gesture. He hasn't said anything yet. All right, uh, gesture's fine. I'll overrule the objection. Um, he gestures to my nose um, and holds out his um, handkerchief, like a cloth handkerchief. Uh, and I instantly felt, just felt really embarrassed. Do you, I felt like I felt ashamed. I, I don't know how else to describe it. I just felt like just really embarrassing. And I went inside the, the room. What, if any, in injury did you have? I had a little blood coming out of my nose. Uh, I didn't know it. I didn't feel it at the time until Jerry gave me the. Jerry let me know. Okay. And I went inside the, um, the hotel room and uh, it. As embarrassing as it is, I, I, um, I, I remember uh, just wanting. I remember just wanting Johnny to say sorry. I wanted him to realize it. It's so stupid, but I, 
like the emotional part. You know, I just wanted him to acknowledge that this was, um, that he, like, he could hurt me, you know? And I wanted it to be okay. I didn't want him to think I was interested in this flight attendant. I didn't want him to think that I would be capable of cheating on him. I was in love with him. I wanted, you know, I just wanted things to be okay. Let's take you to July 9, 2013. Did there come a time that you went for a ride on, you went to the Bahamas and went on a ride with a yacht with Johnny and his kids? Well, it's less like a, we flew out to the Bahamas to his island. Um, he was selling the yacht to JK Rowling and he wanted to kind of have a goodbye trip on the yacht. So it was docked uh, off the island, and I went with him and his uh, kids, who I had quickly developed a bond with and loved. And we brought a friend uh, along with us, I think, to kind of help. And yeah. Okay. T tell tell the jury what happened on that trip. Johnny was uh, upset that he had to sell the boat. Uh, and he was uh, off the wagon again, but he didn't want to tell his kids, so he was hiding it from them. Uh, he was putting it in um, coffee cups and drinking, and the behavior just kind of like, he was upset, he was emotional, and it just, he just, you know, that's how he dealt with it, just drink. But there's just no off button with Johnny. So he just kept drinking, and the behavior kept getting more obviously drunk. And Lily Rose, his daughter at the time, was young, just like maybe 14. And she started to um, get panicky and asked, started to ask me questions about his drinking. Objection hearsay. Without right. saying what Lily Rose was saying, please continue on. Um, Sustained objection. Thank you. So she was asking me questions about the drinking. Um, and was very upset. Sustain the objection. Yeah, you, you yeah. can't say what Lily Rose said. Oh, but yeah. you can you can tell gestures. Sorry. You can tell, and you can say what you and Mr. Depp said. Okay. Sorry. Um, so she was upset, and uh, Johnny kind of we were with the kids, and he kind of threw himself off the boat in a half playful way, um, like a dead. He like dead fish kind of way. I don't know how to describe it. Almost like a belly flop. But we were on a skip, like a, a smaller boat parked next to the yacht. And he's jumping. Well, he jumped off the front of it, but kind of in a, a face chest forward way. Like it, it looked a little scary, like not something somebody would do if they're completely okay. You know, it was, it, it was, started off all of us kind of taking turns jumping off the edge of the yacht uh, into the water and then he at one point kind of throws himself over and it looked a little scary um, the way his body fell into the water and Lily Rose um, started to cry and expressed to me that she Objection here was upset. Objection sustained. You, you can't say what she said. You can say, you can tell expressions or observations, but you can't say what Lily Rose said. Okay. So Lily Rose is crying, and then the crying becomes like a, like a panic, like, a, like almost like a panic attack, uh, it, it, like rapid breathing, crying, lots of questions. And I'm holding her, kind of comforting her, and Johnny comes in. And within a few, um, within a few seconds, I realize that he, you know, kind of shifted his attention on me. And then he, he seemed very angry. Uh, he asked Lily Rose to leave. Lily Rose leaves, looks at me, leaves crying, and Johnny in uh, I don't remember the words he used but starts accusing me of kind of like telling on him and calling him um uh you know a drunk in front of his kids I hadn't I hadn't done that I was actually trying to protect Johnny uh I wasn't it didn't feel like my place at all to share that with with his daughter or, or anyone um 
at the time other than adults who might help with it, but not his kids. So I was trying to tell him, I'm, I was just trying to comfort her. I was trying to protect you. He uh, basically was accusing me of doing this thing and of, of making them aware of his, tr uh, that he was drinking again. And he slams me up against the, the sidewall of the bedroom of the, ca we were in the bedroom this whole time, but up against the wall of the cabin and slams me up by my neck and holds me there for a second and tells me that he, he could fucking kill me. And I was an embarrassment. I was embarrassing. It was embarrassment. This whole thing was a joke, all embarrassment. I made him feel sick. And I'll, ne I'll never forget. I'm, 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 I was I'm very, very, very much in love with this whole family now. And he's saying I'm embarrassing to him. And that somehow stuck in, in, in me more than the, I could fucking kill you. It just sounded like hyperbole. It sounded like something he was just saying, but the, the names that he was calling me were kind of just pushing me up against the wall by my neck, you know, I, it hurt, it hurt my feelings, it hurt. Um, I, uh, when I communicated with, when I saw Lily Rose again, we get, uh, I won't say w what she told me, but the next thing we do is we call for uh, a helicopter to come and take us off of the um, boat or off of the island. So we leave the boat, go to the landing um, of, a, 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 a part of the island, or maybe it was a different you know, island we had to get to to leave, and we, we take off. I'm holding Lily Rose in my, un, literally holding her under my arm while she's crying and we're lifting off. And Jack ended up not coming with us at the last minute. He stayed behind. Um, and we were taking off, and I, rem I remember being really torn about leaving. I, I, I felt bad about leaving, even though that 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 had happened. I, I still felt awful leaving. I felt awful leaving him. I, 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 I also felt like I had done something wrong. You know, he, like he was mad at me. I wasn't sure, you know, what I had done. But I, I remember not being, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting all these text messages from him calling me all these names and it barely coherent, barely, and I'm holding his daughter crying. And let me just stop you for a moment. Michelle, can you pick, pull up Defendant's Exhibit 180? Do you believe it's already in evidence? It is already in the evidence, Your Honor, All so right. we may publish it to the jury. And Amber, I'm gonna ask you to take a look at 180. And this is text messages from Mr. Depp to you. Do you recall these? Yes, I do. And, and are these the text messages? Yes, that's what he was sending me while I was taking care of his daughter. Your Honor, I'm about to go into another event. Should I keep going? I mean, that, that's fine if you think this is a good point to, to break probably, for the day. Okay. I think it's probably a good point. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll go ahead and conclude for today. Again, do not do, read anything about this case. Do not do any outside research and don't discuss it with anybody, okay? Have a good evening. We'll see you in the morning, okay? Thank you.
And again, ma'am, since you're still in the stand, you cannot discuss your testimony with anybody to include your attorneys, okay? All right. Anything further before? All right. We'll see you in the morning. Thank you, Your Honor.